I'd like to call the March 5th, 2019 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us. Let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, As we begin our meeting this evening, I would like to again extend our welcome to Avril Pender, our new Buncombe County Manager who was officially sworn in uh, at a special meeting uh, at 4.30 this afternoon. Avril Pender has worked in, local gov in the local government sector for many years in North Carolina. She comes to us from the other side of the great state of North Carolina, and, but we are glad to have her with us here in the mountains. Buncombe County has a dedicated and talented workforce, and we look forward to Avril Pender's leadership uh, for this organization and community. We also have with us this evening, uh, and we'll be hearing from him in a little while, our newly elected Sheriff uh, Quentin Miller. We welcome the opportunity to have Sheriff Miller uh, with us to talk about his vision and goals for our community's law enforcement and public safety uh, this year and into the future. So before we begin this meeting, let's have a moment of silence for prayer or reflection and appreciation for all the men and women who work for Buncombe County and the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department, who work hard for the people of this community every day. Uh, we thank you all for what you do to uh, serve the people of this county. Uh, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again for being with us. Uh, I'd like to announce that if you use the county's parking facility uh, or Asheville Transit to attend this meeting, there are uh, parking validation, uh, there's parking validation available with one of the uh, officers who is uh, here. So if you'd uh, like to uh, have that validation, then please see those folks on your way out. We wanna make it easy for folks to attend our county meetings. I'm going to read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at this meeting. Okay, we come to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda uh, and follow the remainder of the agenda as published. And I will also note that the um, medic agenda item was moved from new business to old business. As so moved. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So uh, we've got a couple of informational presentations, and the first one is from Sheriff Quentin Miller. Uh, Sheriff Miller, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to hearing from you about what's going on in the Sheriff's Department. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. So uh, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. So to the board members, a correction, the board of commissioners, the county manager, and the citizens of Buncombe County, good evening. It's a pleasure to be before you this evening. Without further ado, I will present to you the state of Buncombe County Sheriff's Office. I will talk to you about your investment and commitment to the safety of Buncombe County and all of its citizens. 
and transitioning to the 21st century policing. Why is this imp implementation of 21st century policing crucial and important? Trust between law enforcement agency and the people they protect and serve is essential in a democracy. It is key to the stability of our community, the integrity of our criminal justice system, and the safe and effective delivery of policing services. I'm asking you today to invest in Buncombe County Sheriff's Office with the understanding that the 21st century policing is a strategic framework that will guide our work and decision making. Since being sworn in as your Buncombe County Sheriff, I have talked to members of our county and the committed employees of the Sheriff's Office. And I'm convinced we have an incredible opportunity here to make a difference in the lives of our citizens including those already incarcerated and the youth headed that way. Sheriff Miller, one, one moment. I th if we could get some technical assistance, I think the clicker is having some issues just to make sure folks can follow along with the slide presentation. You know, we need to buy a better clicker. This is uh, a <laughs> this. You are not the only one who has uh, had I, issues with this. Yeah, clicker, actually, so. I think it's. <laughs> are y'all are y'all are y'all sure it's called a clicker? <laughs> That's the technical name is for it. Yes. Are you it's sure? A clicker. Yeah, Did yes. you Google that earlier? So? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I wouldn't either. It's all about where you point it, guys. How about now? Okay, as I said before, that um, the Sheriff's Office, I am convinced we have an incredible opportunity to make differences in the lives of our citizens, including those incarcerated and those headed that way. The challenges are many from the mental health to the substance abuse to early childhood to unemployment. As a 25-year veteran of law enforcement, I have witnessed the highs and lows of this profession, and unfortunately, I believe we are in a valley right now. In the next few slides, I'm going to describe a portion of my vision to come out of the valley, and I hope to have you, the Buncombe County Commissioners, support as we tackle these systemic issues together. We must bring our community together. And what that means is bringing the community, the law enforcement, and the local government together. Part of that is our residents of Buncombe County. We need them to participate in problem solving efforts to reduce crime and improve the quality of life. This is through our town hall meetings. The Buncombe County Commissioners to create listening opportunities with various areas and groups in the community listen and engage in dialogue regarding concerns or issues related to trust, conduct community surveys on attitudes toward policing, and publish the results. The Buncombe County Sheriff's Office, we want to review and update our policies, training, and data. We want to collect, do a collection on our use of force and engage the community members and police, engage our community members Increase the transparency of data, p policies, and procedures. Ensures officers have access to the tools they need to keep them safe. Although new to the Bunker County Sheriff's Office, I know men and women and youth in our community, and I will be a sheriff that's, that will be inclusive and will serve everyone. My vision will require commitment on the part of the county I need you to invest in the Sheriff's Office. The investment is a request for 21 positions, which I will break down into four sections. Policing and public safety, detention, oversight and transparency, and community engagement. I'm committed to partnering with communities to engage in neighborhood problem solving, to be effective and efficient I will need 10 personnel 
crime prevention sergeant, eight patrol deputies, and the evidence room technician. So I've broken those down. The crime prevention, the crime prevention sergeant and the patrol deputies were focused on the community engagement as measures, as means of increased public safety. Buncombe County Sheriff's Office currently has an average of 12 to 14 patrol deputies who are covering 656 square miles per shift. The request will increase the patrol deputies coverage from that of 12 to 14 to 14 to 16 per shift. Deputies require us to be driven by call volumes, prevent us from having the opportunity to engage our community. The levels will have a lasting impact. I'm gonna ask Lieutenant Kaiser to step up now. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. First, I'd like to thank the sheriff for inviting me to speak today on behalf of the patrol division within the sheriff's office, and I'd like to thank you folks for allowing me to speak today as well. Uh, we talk about those numbers, we talk about 21st century policing, and we have the vision of being a community of we, but with 656 square miles, on most nights, I have 12 to 14 officers that are working. And that's a good night, folks. That's a good night in your communities that we want to be more engaged in, that we want to be a part of and be that community of we. We look at numbers, we look at, look at statistics over the last few years and our, and our crime rates, we see that things have dropped. But if you look on a national level as a whole, violent crimes are starting to increase again. And we don't have the numbers to combat that. Some nights we work at minimum staffing levels and we've been able to do those things that we've done over the last few years, but it's becoming very hard. The attrition rate on our officers is, it's ridiculous sometimes. We have officers out sick, we have officers injured. If someone gets injured or someone gets sick, it puts us that much further down. We're having a hard time keeping up. To become a community of we, we need your help, we need your help to make us a better part of you, to be able to see the sheriff's vision out. Some extra folks would really be nice. Anything else, sir? Thank you. Thank you. The next one we talk about the evidence room technician. The position of the evidence room technician plays a critical role in how we maintain the integrity and property that we now have. We have over 31,000 pieces of property and there's a poor handling of this property and evidence whether by intentional wrongdoing or lack of oversight by understaffing that only serves to erode the public's trust. I don't know if you saw the top story this morning in the morning or the top story this morning on the news, but it spoke about what happens in another county about their property. And so I'm concerned about how we now handling our property within Buncombe County. I talked to you about staffing, that we would have two people available at all times. So if we, as we move from one point of the property room to another, it should be two people in what we call the two-man rule. So again, that is some of the ask today, is that how do we now address this issue? You will often hear, and the office has heard me say this, it's about what we know, when we know, and what do we do. So now we know that we have an issue in our property room and we're bringing this to our, you know, everyone's attention and we have to do something about it. Next, I wanna talk about the detention center. We're requesting five positions for detention, four intake specialists or detention officers, one detention facility detective. Adding uh, the intake specialist will allow us to change the culture of the detention facility. By implementing an intake specialist on each operational squad, we can adopt a new mindset with regards to service and delivery. At the initial entry of an arrestee to the detention facility, an intake specialist will evaluate through a questionnaire any force used in an arrest, the impaired and intoxicated levels of the arrestee, and the need for any medical attention. All of this occurs before the arrestee enters the detention facility. So the detention uh, facility detective, so we're now in a position, once again, that we're having contraband found in our detention facility. 
And so we will speak to you about, you know, some of the measures that we are now taking. But also I want to tell you that, again, it's about what do we know and when do we know and what do we do. And so this detention detective would be a way of us now following up when we find contraband in our facility. And when I say follow up, we need to start doing reports on that and then following up for prosecution and charges. And so this is another means of not just charging people because we don't want them released just on, you know, that time served. We need to have a case. And so that would help us with a, having a detective to address this. So also I'm going to have Lieutenant Luttrell step forward and speak to you about the detention facility. Thank you, Sheriff. Yes, sir. And thank you, uh, Commissioner, for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, again, my name is Jeffrey Luttrell, uh, and I've been with the detention facility for uh, going on 15 years. Uh, and my role is currently the operations lieutenant overseeing all the operations of the facility. Uh, I'd like to begin by advocating for these five positions in detention by asking the three questions uh, Sheriff has already asked is what you know, when you knew it, or when you knew about it, and what did you uh, do about it. Uh, these questions is the basis for our understanding and decision making throughout the Sheriff's Office uh, since December 3rd. Uh, and I will start with what we know. We know not having an intake specialist puts the detention center at a severe disadvantage when preventing contraband from enter entering the facility. We know it's, it is better to be proactive than reactive when dealing with the problem. And we know it is better, uh, secondly, it is when you knew it. Having these intake specialists, they will be tasked with asking screening questions immediately like the sheriff has talked about. These questions will include drug usage, uh, if they've ingested any drugs and um, alcohol. Uh, they'll also be asking the arresting officer questions and screening the arresting officer. Is this you know, individual being combative? Have they said anything during the course of arrest that would allude that they would be a suicide over anything? Anything that we would need to know to better care for that individual. Uh, we're also, detention will soon need an officer on each squad to be assigned to operate our body scanner, which will be getting installed six to eight, uh, in six to eight weeks. So that is very important. Uh, lastly is what did you do? Our officers in detention do amazing, uh, amazing things on a daily basis. They have an extremely hard job and they need our support. Uh, the fifth position is for a detention investigator who will focus, like the sheriff said, uh, investigating officers' assaults because those have gone up in our facility and reports involving inmates possessing contraband within our facility. We provide many services and programs for all our inmates if they want to uh, contribute and participate in those programs to help them succeed. If they choose to come in our facility and about still uh, have, you know, conduct criminal activity and assault our officers, we want to be able to prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law and make and hold them accountable and do it the right way. Thank you, Sheriff. So next I will be moving to the oversight and transparency. That currently the, the, the office currently has one position that provides internal IT support and tests, requires deploys and maintain technology. They, he handles all our tasers, all of our um, technology for his radios, inside the vehicles and handhelds, body-worn cameras. And currently he does pretty much everything we want him to do when it comes time to IT. And the short of this is he's overworked and I need more help with him. So um, definitely that. The next thing is a policy an analysis. So I've spoken on several occasions about the policies that exist. And so we have trouble tracking those policies for us, who has signed it and when they signed it, and especially when we make changes. And I've, you know, been able to find that out when I start making changes. So it goes back again to what we know, when we know, and what do we do. So we have a need to have someone who can help us track, you know, these policies and get our policies up to date, as well as keeping them up to date and keeping people informed of what they are and why. The next one position will be a sergeant in professional standards. That's like the internal affairs part of the office, meaning that these uh, folks will kind of help us and again, keep us on track and make sure that we're investigating things thoroughly. 
you know, internally as well as ensuring that if there comes a situation that we have a neutral set of eyes sitting on things and looking at it so that we can, one, do what we're needing to do for us discipline and keeping being transparent. So that becomes very important for us. I now move to what I call very, very important to me, this community engagement. When I talk about community engagement, I start thinking about community outreach. And for those of you familiar with the COPS programs, it's pretty much we get people from all over the organization and we go into a community. And at that time, we will strategize and plan with that community to in fact, you know, develop solutions. I like that idea. The difference is I wanted more and more means that we have to stay constantly engaged instead of waiting to come back three to six months. We'll now be able to now address things as they're happening if we are able to have people, you know, engage, you know, I'm gonna call it community engaged person that will be able to work with our community on a regular basis opposed to three to six months at a time. Um, again, the complete overview and I'd just like to share this with you. Moving forward is imperative that we take a new approach and adopt a new mindset for our deputies based on innovative approaches of 21st century policing, changing the mindset of that of being warriors to that of being guardians. Again, I've broken down the 21 new positions into four categories. So it comes down to the positions that we request require an initial investment of $1,269,000, which includes 600,000 in vehicles. And if you're looking at our spreadsheet, you can see that we also have a housing revenue of 315,000, which means the cost will be 954,000. And I will tell you, this is like a one-time expense due to the vehicles. We won't have to go back and you know, buy or purchase those again. So the overall budget is a 4.13 increase to the fiscal year 19 budget. Last but not least, I have to talk to you about our fleet vehicles. And so I'm gonna ask Sherry Powell to step up to give you information on our fleet. Commissioners, my name is Sherry Powers. I'm the Sheriff's Business Officer, and thank you for giving us the time to go through this tonight. When Sheriff Miller took office, we began to review every aspect of the Sheriff's Office. One area that, um, where there was obvious need was the Sheriff's fleet. We have approximately 267 vehicles. Of those vehicles, we classify them in three ways. Priority one vehicles are marked and unmarked vehicles, primarily used in enforcement roles, which include responding to calls for service and specialized enforcement. Those examples of those are patrol and our civil process vehicles who also fill in for patrol. These vehicles are called upon to possibly run code to get somewhere quickly if there's a need in the county. Um, priority two vehicles are secondary response vehicles used in primarily in non-enforcement roles, but are su also subject to emergency response if the situation requires. Examples of those are our criminal investigations, our detective vehicles, and other support staff. Priority three vehicles are primarily special use. They're things like our animal control vehicles, inmate transport vehicles that require special upfitting for the use they're designed for. In evaluating the sheriff's fleet, we reviewed available data and conducted surveys of law enforcement agencies to determine best practice in our in industry. We spoke to the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. We looked at a published survey by the FBI where they looked at law enforcement agencies all over the country. Uh, and we spoke to the 10 largest counties in North Carolina that closely compared to our size and scope of, of work. Uh, it was determined that best practice calls for the replacement of priority one enforcement vehicles between 80 and 100,000 miles. Um, we have a slide that shows you of our 267 vehicles, priority one vehicles, 144 of those are priority one vehicles. Um, 
Of those, 48 of our Priority One vehicles ha currently have over 120,000 miles, and 14 of those have over 150,000 miles. Um, this deviates from best practice and was an obvious area of need for the sheriff in the way of safety and providing the services that the county expects of the sheriff's office. Um, to help us achieve a healthy fleet and follow best practice, the sheriff's requesting the county replace 40 enforcement vehicles annually, and, re and this will require an approximate investment of $1.6 million. As you can see from the slide, historically, we have been um, underfunded in that area according to our research for best practice. Over the years, we've, we've had between 12 and 26 vehicles replaced on an annual basis, and that sort of compounded the effect on our fleet today. Thank you. Questions? All right, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you who uh, uh, spoke. Yeah, I, I got a question. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about it. I want to thank you for coming out to Inca Candler and uh, visiting with, uh, with the folks out there. I think it was a good session. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the patrols, and it may be too early. Do you have any idea where those eight patrol officers, do you have any direction on kind of what areas those would probably go to? Well, what we would do is put two in each shift, I mean, on each part. So one, two, and three, they would have them all over the county. Okay. Thanks. So the total of eight would be more or less two on each shift. <coughs> okay. Thanks. Sheriff Miller, thank you for the, and to the staff of the Sheriff's Office, thank you all for being here in your presentation. Just a quick follow-up question about the intake specialist position. Is that a position that currently exists, um, or is intake being handled differently uh, uh, under current policies? It will be new positions. A new position. And um, is that something where you'd envision any specialized training for those folks, or, uh, or would it be a, any detention officer could, or, or standard training would prepare a detention officer for that role? It would probably be a new training, because we have a new machine that's coming, and that they would uh, be able to utilize that machine to keep us safe. Thank you. appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you guys for your time. And um, I've not got a you guys. Think I've got a, a couple. Okay, questions. go ahead. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so you know, you're making these recommendations uh, based on needs you're seeing right now. Do you anticipate that there will be other additional funding requests that might be identified by the sheriff's department between now and when we approve our budget? in june or do you think like you've had a, a sufficient amount of time that you know this is really this is it this is what this is what it looks like or is it this but you know there may be other things identified between now and uh when we vote on the budget in june i think that there may be other things and the reason i will tell you that is part of this community of we is how we go out to our community and now ask our community about their needs and they may be some different and so we want to address our community so once we start again with the community outreach, we'll be able to answer some of those questions, as well as having, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, I would tell you that we would like for all the commissioners to visit, you know, our detention facility and, of course, the county manager. <coughs> and again, I'm taking the approach that we need help and we have to do this together. So if there's something out there that we may overlook or that you see our need, we would like to have you have input also. So I would the answer to your question is yes. I think there may be other things out there okay. that we may need some help. So I think the reason I mentioned the patrols when I look at, and I don't know, I mean, you are the experts on what you need, but when I hear from the public when I'm out in the community, it, a lot of the things that you're requesting, you know, flies over the top of their head. They're not really interested in it. They want more presence, they, which, you know, is, is more patrol you know more people uh, in the in their area and so that's pr predominantly what I what I hear in the community and so since I had the opportunity to tell you I figured I'd reinforce that um, but that's that's mainly what I hear Alan I mean I think some of the things you presented and you know part of your model 
you know, that you're wanting to try to, you know, go towards those things. But what I, but the patrol is what I hear out in the community, just the presence and having the comfort of knowing that, that, that they're there. And they, I, I want to say this, the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department, y'all do an amazing job. Uh, my district is, is taken care of. They love you. Uh, no matter whether you're at, uh, you know, whether you're in your car or whether you're speaking to them at Miami, wherever it is, uh, they, uh, they, they appreciate what you do. And, uh, um, but you know, in this day of where people are concerned about their homes and things, so you, you just primarily here, I'd just like to see more. And I know there's a certain, only a certain amount that we can, you know, that we can invest or that we can spend and you gotta be practical and you gotta balance all of that. But that's, that's what I hear out there, Sheriff. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I really appreciate the presentation and uh, the information. I do think it'll be important for us to you know, here, if there's other, if there's other important budgetary needs, you know, over the next couple of months, of course, we want to hear those together because I think it's, um, it's important that we look at all this together. There's always more needs than enough funds to do everything you would, would like to do. And um, so I think we want to look at that, look at that together and uh, make sure we're trying to, you know, get the resources to have the most beneficial impact that, that we can. Um, you know, just, I mean, just as one example on, you know, this uh, couple of meetings ago, the, the grant came up for the additional uh, SROs, which is a great program. We're doing it. And part of the concerns I had around that was that we were making a decision where, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Of, we got an initial grant, but to sustain it will cost, you know, the county through the sheriff's department, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in perpetuity, right? So, uh, and there might be more such requests uh, in that arena. So I just think it'd be, it'd be this, is, this is a lot of information, um, but if there's other parts of this too, to be able to kind of look at all that together and figure out, you know, which parts can we take on this year? We're not gonna probably be able to get to all this, you know, in one, one bite at the apple, but which parts can we take a step on now? And then, you know, over time, hopefully we can, we can really, you know, meet all the important um, priorities. Any other uh, questions? or comments from any commissioners on this topic? Yeah, the comment I would have is, thank you, Sheriff Miller, it's a good presentation. Uh, but one of the concerns I would have is, I agree with Brownie in that let's see by budget time everything that you need. We need to know that. But also, too, we're gonna need, to prior need you to prioritize what you need first, what now, because it's a good chance that we might not be able to do this all in one year, depending on what we have on the budget. But uh, we need to get some idea and we need to start. You know, I'll be the first to say that. And I would too like to say when you talk about the vehicles, which surprised me because one thing I can say from traveling in the county when I'm out there, uh, this is something in the last four or five years that I see now that it was a time I would never see a sheriff's car if I was going out to Leicester or depending where I see. But now I see as many sheriff's cars as I do police cars. I live in the city and I might see more sheriff's cars really, which is good, keep up the good work. But we wanna make sure that you have a good fleet and that everybody is safe. But no, I would like to say that that's one of the we need to be able to prioritize so that we'll know what you really need now, what we've got to do. Because at budget time, from what little I've seen so far, we've got a lot coming at us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want to, but we definitely want to take care of you on know, what you need. I, I would just like to thank all the, all the commissioners and also to say that I do truly intend to work with the commissioners and I'm hoping that you guys would have the same commitment because I think it's time for us to do something in Buncombe County, not only just taking care of our community as far as our youth, you know, we have other issues to address and I would agree of how do we keep our community safe and then we also have the opiates crisis and we also have this young uh, child, early childhood education piece so um, I do understand that there are needs and I just want to make sure that you know we do that together I have one last one last comment which is just you know the other the other big part of this is um, you know the capacity of the detention facility right and and can we yeah as a community yeah. 
live with what we've got in terms of existing capacity, or is there going to be a need for expansion in the in the um, near future, or, or 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 at some point? So I think that's an important part of the conversation too, because if if there is a need to expand, that's a very expensive capital item, and it needs to be considered, you know, alongside these operating um, issues as well. Um, of course, I think it's the last thing any of us would want to spend more more dollars on. We want to spend it on investing in people and schools and things like that. But we, you know, but we have to we have to look at that. So it's it's being discussed, but I think it's got to be looked at real um, carefully. Uh, right at, through this budget process as well, and hopefully we can reach a good resolution on what our outlook is on that question too. And I got one if more. I could, sorry, you go ahead. Okay. If I could uh, just a quick, a quick add on to that and a request for the next time we get to sit down with you, Sheriff, is um, I would really like to hear you and your team's specific analysis around the jail population issue and uh, kind of the full menu of strategies we we could be exploring, not just around potentially reducing jail population, but also kind of longer term planning. Um, it's a conversation we had with Sheriff Duncan regularly and would just appreciate hearing your team's perspective. Um, uh, so not just sort of the budgetary side of the house, but also kind of specific um, strategies we could look at in the short term. We definitely look forward to that. And as, as I stated before, we welcome anyone who wants to come and take a tour that we will make that happen. Absolutely. The, the other thing I was going to mention was that, you know, with the addition of our new, you know, county manager from um, New Hanover County, coming from New Hanover County and bringing the, your experience here when it comes to, to looking at uh, w whether it's a jail or whether it's, you know, the funding within the sheriff's department, other things, I think, you know, we're going to, you know, we have a, we have a, uh, a great opportunity to, to, um, to uh, um, rely on your experience and some of the information that you'll bring as you as you uh, craft some of this and, and bring it to us you know as we look at all this so i'm excited about that too so we are too <laughs> we are too <laughs> all right sheriff great to see you thanks to uh, Thank you. all the officers and personnel who are here with, with us tonight Absolutely. thanks for everything you do thank we appreciate you, it yeah. and uh look forward to talking further okay thank you yep mm -hmm. all right <laughs> Next up, we have uh, a presentation about the community health improvement process and community health assessment. And uh, Jen Shepard, our public health director, is going to lead us on this item. Hi. Thanks for seeing Very good. Good evening. Good evening. There's a presentation, I believe, to put up. There we go. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. <clears throat> so, good evening, and thank you for having me this evening. Um, and I would like to just point out in the audience um, our team of Cha and Chip uh, staff and um, uh, some of our advisory. Council supporters are in the audience, so I don't I want to recognize them. <clears throat> so I'm Jan Shepard and I'm your public health director. And under direction and delegation from Stoney Blevins, who's our Health and Human Services Director, I administer <clears throat> excuse me, the um, public health programs in the county. So the community health assessment um, is a um, core and essential core and essential, excuse me, um, public health uh, function in our community. It's largely uh, in the background um, and well supported by many, many community partners um, that surround us in this work. So I'm really pleased to be here tonight to give you an update. <clears throat> so on the screen you see the summary of what I'd like to um, uh, talk to you about tonight, and that's the summary of the assessment and the improvement process, the overview of the data and the prioritization process, how we leverage our partners, <clears throat> the review, the standout health conditions, and what's next in our community health process. So you have some handouts, and basically you have three handouts that are uh, duplications of some of the slides, and that's because some of the slides are, have a lot of words on them, so I thought it would help uh, provide some clarity for you. 
So the purpose of the community health assessment is to identify what factors affect the health of the community, what challenges we have, and what resources are available to us to address these factors. <coughs> this uh, slide you see shows the timeline, kind of demonstrates how the cycle works. It, it shows where we are in the process right now, which is in phase one. And it, um, it allows you to see what the timeline going forward is. So this community health assessment and improvement process is a required um, function of public health across the state. And it is required by the, the Division of Public Health at the state and also the accreditation board that accredits um, local health departments. So we do this process every three years. We start with a community health assessment. It's a product that um, does, does exactly what it says. It is, assesses the health of the community. We talk about what are the strengths in our community? What health concerns do the community members have? What do we need in our community to address these concerns? And what resources are available to us? Ultimately, from this process, we will develop, implement, and evaluate our strategies to address our identified health concerns. We have a unique um, <clears throat> partner in our uh, western region called well, uh, Western North Carolina Healthy Impact. This is a regional effort that's supported by, in, by financial and in-kind contributions from hospitals, public health departments, partners, and this is housed and coordinated by WNC Health Network Incorporated. This is also another handout that you have because there's a lot of information on this slide. But what you're seeing on this slide is really the core partnerships that support this work across our community. So we have Health and Human Services, Mission Health System, MAHEC, as I said before, uh, healthy impact. And we also have community engagement team, which is uh, a, a team that sits in, under our county leadership. And that helps connect us with, uh, with the community. So the CHIP Advisory Council is essentially our health coalition, which is a piece of the assessment and improvement process that's required that brings together all your partners in a community to help you do all of those things that we talk about, identifying the issues, looking for resources, et cetera. Within our system, we also then, as I mentioned, our CHIP staff. So we have a position under Health and Human Services that coordinates the Child on the Chip process. And then through MAHEC, we have our health improvements um, specialist staff, and they help support this work. We also provide technical assistance to our community partners and our agencies that help lead the implementation of our strategies. So you, you hear a lot about social determinants of health. And in, in our CHIP process, we really want to talk about and implement and develop and implement strategies on the components of population, uh, or excuse me, of social determinants of health. So we know that about 20% of a, a individual's health status is around their interactions with their medical providers. The rest of that health status is truly dependent on the things that they're in their environment such as housing, transportation, um, and, and factors that are around the community that affect health status. So we take great uh, lengths to address social determinants of health. If you'll remember in 2015, we had four strategies that we were um, considering. Infant mortality, <clears throat> excuse me, obesity and chronic disease prevention intimate partner violence, and substance use prevention. So briefly, a few examples of some of the work that came out of that three-year cycle was that there was a clinical shift at MAHEC focusing on equity around infant mortality. The YMCA and AVIPA partnered to deliver a minorities diabetes prevention program under obesity and chronic disease prevention. The Family Justice Center um, 
was ultimately a, a great resource for uh, the issue around intimate partner violence, and expanding harm reduction resources and youth engagement around our substance abuse prevention. In 2018, there were five issues that rose to the top of our um, focus. Birth outcomes and infant mortality, asthma and COPD, childhood obesity, substance abuse and chronic pain, and mental health. So all of these issues are important, but we accepted a challenge from our State Division of Public Health to select two priorities that we really wanted to focus on. So we chose birth outcomes and infant mortality and mental health. I would like to say that birth outcomes and infant mortality is really um, a representation of your overall community health. <laughs> Because the barriers that exist for healthy pregnant women having healthy children at birth really are reflective of the barriers that affect the health of your community. We're also seeing that mental health, such as adverse childhood experiences, is also a similar proxy around a whole entire community's health status. Now, it'll be necessary for us to um, narrow mental health down. That's a huge bucket of uh, potential issues. So we want to focus on some manageable <clears throat> set of objectives around that. I want to emphasize that while public health is not responsible for, no do, nor do we take credit for, much of the work that is accomplished in a community around improved health. But it is important to note that our role as conveners and leaders of this cycle and processes contained within is essential. So birth outcomes and infant mortality, some of the strategies that are working in our favor right now is Mothering Asheville, NFP and other home visiting services, Mother Love, which connects birth uh, excuse me, uh, teens, uh, pregnant teens and educational goals, and then our effort to become a breast friendly, breastfeeding friendly community. Around mental health, things that we're going to be considering are building resilient communities, peer-to-peer -peer programs, access to behavioral health services, harm reduction and equity and CLAS services. So we want to be rethinking how we do health and how we define health, how we deliver health, and how we pay for health. <clears throat> a healthy bunkum is possible. <clears throat> We're well on our way, and we look to you for support in achieving this vision. So thank you again for allowing me to speak to you tonight. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. All right. Thank you so much. Questions? I just got a com uh, comment. Um, you know, I look I look through everything and I appreciate the presentation. Tremendous amount of uh, a lot of strategy in here, a lot of that content. Um, I, I I would love to see uh, um, uh, a few more goals. What you know? What do you what do you hope to things that are measurable? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. So our process, um, as we are um, establishing our work groups around our focused health conditions, uh, that those will be embedded in our action plans. So we will be <coughs> doing measurable goals and objectives. Um, and that uh, work will be happening through the spring and the summer. Um, and we'll be happy to continuously communicate with you all around those objectives and goals that we're hoping to achieve. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Jan, thank you so much for the presentation. We really appreciate thank it you. and uh, all you do. Okay. We do not have any public hearings and I don't believe we have a county manager's report. No problem. So we come to old business and the first item is a resolution authorizing execution of a memorandum of understanding between the county 
of Buncombe and the Board of Trustees of Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College. Michael Frew will tee us off on this. I will do my best. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we're bringing this back today only, only to bring to the Board's attention uh, this isn't a matter for a vote today. The Board voted on this matter a couple weeks ago. Um, it's presented exactly as presented two weeks ago with the addition of items related to uh, the suggestion that the, this board and the trustees at the college uh, work together to appoint an advisory committee for future capital projects. The idea was that it would be modeled after the Buncombe uh, School Capital Fund Commission, and I included language in the resolution uh, to give some leeway on that in the event that the college trustees might say that, uh, well, we think maybe seven members would work better or that rather than a community member, uh, X, Y, or Z might work better. And I think that was consistent with uh, the chairman's motion a couple weeks ago that would be open to discussion, but just want to have some advisory panel uh, appointed partly by this board and partly by the board of trustees. The, uh, and the only additional language in the memorandum is consistent with that which with the new section five which says that the this board and the board of trustees will work together to appoint an advisory board for future capital projects consistent with that model of the Buncombe school capital fund uh two appointed by this board two by the other board and one community member but again this uh this uh allows for some leeway on the part of the trustees and would not require if it's consistent with this resolution to come back to this board I understand that the trustees are due to meet tomorrow afternoon and I've discussed it with uh, the board attorney and he has copies of, of this material so um, question though are you asking us to mm -hmm. this does look to be consistent with what was discussed at the last meeting I just so wanted to make sure that um, this board saw that the changes were made and that this is what we're presented and have presented to the trustees for vote consistent with the vote of this board and the recommendation okay. for the slight change prior but from the county's perspective, we've already voted on this. So yes. we don't need another vote tonight. You're just showing us the language that was crafted to just see if there were any comments or feedback on it or? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, are there any comments on it? <laughs> so, so I don't, um, I don't have any comments on this other than this goes back to the, to the board for them to approve it, right? Yes, sir. The college trustees are meeting tomorrow afternoon to consider uh, this resolution or rather this memorandum of understanding. Okay. Because they had a meeting prior and uh, the language regarding the uh, joint advisor committee was not included. So they determined that they should meet again to make sure they're all on board with that. So if it, do, if it does please the board, I would like to make, and I, need, I, need, I may need some help with this. Okay. I, I would like to make a... Um, uh, separate from this, either direction or or motion. I, I had a, a concern. I think other uh, folks may share this concern, of, uh, and I'm going to put an approximate uh, dollar amount on it, and I'll leave it to staff to uh, make sure that that's accurate. About four hundred fifty-two thousand dollars that was spent um, uh, for salaries uh, that. Um, uh, if it if it please the board I would like to direct that that be returned to operations for AB Tech uh, and be uh, out of our general fund over um, uh, four years but that 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 be and, I, and I, it, it's either a direct direction if it please the board uh, or motion so between you and the county manager can y'all tell me how to make sure I present that properly uh, yes sir Commissioner Belcher I believe the appropriate mechanism since you're generally speaking of a, of a budget item would be to direct the county manager to work with that and bring it back to the board in May and June during the budget cycle uh, and I would certainly like you know to see if the if the if well the I mean the board has to make that direction that is that's that's a um it's not my recommendation it's a recommendation based on some input that i that i have received and that i support so uh, i think it would be in um, um uh, in good uh, in good faith uh, with our partnership with with ab tech to do that 
So. Well, I think that would be appropriate thing to do, just to ask the county manager, and I don't think you need to vote on it at this point, and probably can, it's not been added to right. the agenda, but just ask that this idea be floated and brought back to the board at the appropriate time. And I wanted to be specific in the ask, though, because it was sa the salaries mm -hmm. only, and it, I think it was approximately $452,000. So. Yes, sir. And I would welcome any other comments from the board. So I'm, I'm su supportive of the idea. The, um, you know, the other, the other part, though, that I would also add would be, um, you know, spending – Spending the the funds to pay for that staff time, um, I, regardless of what you might want to say about the actions of the former county manager, you know, she and the other staff people probably did spend some time on it, probably. and that's it's, so it's probably. not an entirely illegitimate thing. Right. But the amounts of money that were spent are just completely uh, <laughs> exaggerated, yeah, right? So, yeah, so, yeah. so and I, but I wouldn't want to argue over the nickels and dimes of it. So just, just. Uh, reimbursing it in its entirety is is fine is would be fine with me the but the other the other part that i would also add <clears throat> that from my perspective when we when we look at this issue and we look at what the referendum um the funding levels that were talked about in the referendum a uh, little over 129 million dollars was going to be invested in capital at ab tech the other thing that i think should be considered is that um you know, Green interfered with, uh, uh, changed some of the building plans. And so some of the projects that were funded were things that AB Tech really did not want. So if we really want to say that, that AB Tech is going to be assured that they get approximately $130 million of investment in projects that really are their priorities, then I think we need to say that not only over this next planning horizon, that they'll get to the $139 million level, I think there should probably be another 10 to $12 million of additional investments, recognizing that there was about that much money spent on projects that they really did not request. And so that's, that's the other part I would also add to, if we're gonna try to respect what was committed in the referendum time, I think that's an important part as well. So, and I, I wouldn't, I w what I would say is, is that with the addition of the, um, uh, the commission, mm -hmm that that would be one of the things that the commission would look at and and take up separately from what i'm suggesting because what i'm suggesting is a budget item uh but uh i, I mean i would suggest <coughs> that, that that conversation be one of the conversations in the, in well, the commission. well the reason the reason uh i mean they could certainly work on kind of fleshing it out but part of the reason i bring it up now is that this resolution you know it includes a very specific amount of money that's guaranteed but it doesn't add up to um, you know, to if we wanted to add, if we wanted to say we want to guarantee you get 140 million dollars of projects that are really your priorities, then the the current funding schedule doesn't add up to that number. Well, it does, and I proved it last week. 83 million. I put a PowerPoint up. It's over 137 million dollars. We're the county wanted to give away 6.5 million. It's been reduced down to 5 million. So the county right now is giving a million and a half dollars back per, per year for eight years. That comes up to 12 and a half million dollars. At least we're trying to put something back into Kitty. And that's, you know, that's where you're talking, Brownie. The, the 400 and some thousand dollars and all the numbers that were thrown out there in that process, that's where Wanda went and borrowed money to do the, uh, or refinance the fire training center in three different items. It come up to 13.8 some million. But I proved the other week that anything that we do between now and 2028, and if you look at the sheet, it don't say all new buildings. The 83 million showed rhododendron, showed elm, it showed all these buildings to be repaired. So we can't go with the, with the sale of all new buildings. The process that we have going now is going to work. There's areas that it can work in that's better than, you know, we've seen. I like the idea of seven people because we've had three and three, three from the school, three from here, plus our staff, 
or you, you haven't had opportunity to be in on it. But I just, it's time to put this to bed. It's time for the school and us, we're locking down uh, basically a total of over $137 million. As it goes past that, and what I forgot to say in my PowerPoint was, this is not going to sunset. It can't. Because the bills don't come due until 2034 and 2035. If we tried to sunset it, that would put it back on the county. So then we'd have to go up on property tax. It's real simple. I thought this was done. We have a vote tomorrow. Whatever the vote comes out, it just comes out. I am 100% for that school. I'm 100% for what needs to be done to that school. And it's, you know, we can either let the buildings fall down and build new ones, or we can fix the ones that's there now to bring them back up to a standard that's a whole lot better than they are today. And that's where I'm at. Thank you. And because this is a sort of continues to be an active deliberation and dialogue between the Board of Commissioners and the uh, Board of Trustees at AB Tech um, and the broader community, I, I just feel like we have to kind of pause once again and, and as we discussed last time, um, see that there actually is an opportunity, I think, to get to an even better version of this plan. Um, and I, I think the, uh, the magnitude of this issue and the importance of this relationship and the opportunity to do right in this relationship, get this back into right relationship for sort of a broken one right now. Um, just to me, uh, ask us to take a little bit more time with this proposal to restore, as uh, I would agree with Chairman Newman's proposal to um, not just restore the, or achieve the level of funding that was promised during the campaign, but to get to a level that actually uh, uh, addresses the ways funds were, were spent um, that didn't serve the campus's needs and didn't serve the community needs. So. Um, I recognize that that's my, that might not be where this lands, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that I, I think um, this proposal could be strengthened. And, and Commissioner Belcher, I would support uh, specifically restoring the 452,000, but I want to go further than that and, and get it all done at once and, and take, I think, a little bit more time um, to, to do that and, and to um, kind of to make sure we, we don't just put it to bed, but that we do it right. So I'll say it was pretty, uh, well, this is not the right word, but I knew it was risky for, when, for me to do what I did because I expected that there would be some passionate dialogue on what we had voted on before. We have to realize this goes to their board and it'll come back to us and then and uh, we're going to have the commission and we can look at that. You know, what's before us has been voted on, so we, we, have, to, we have to deal with that. I mean, my suggestion was to... Um, to, you know, to direct staff to do that, and it, I've heard a couple of people like it. So um, you know, we got to get to a point to where mm -hmm. I think we've got enough to. If it's okay with people on my left, I think we got enough to direct her to do that. So I think this is a great step forward in starting to rebuild the relationship with AB Tech and to restore trust between the two entities. The time that I've been up here, we've talked about making Buncombe County whole from previous transgressions. I view this situation as making AB Tech whole from previous transgressions. That's what we're a trying. building was torn down, rhododendron, with a promise of a new building. Um, that has not yet been discussed as part of that. The campus lost over 60,000 square feet of classroom space at the direction of the county. And I think that we're heading in the right direction to rectifying that. This is on us as a board of commissioners to correct. We can continue to wag our finger. We can continue to lay blame on previous leadership. It is on us to rectify this situation and to take it slow. I wholeheartedly agree. Let's take the time to correct it and to get to the best possible version of a plan that we can so that we are all at the end of the day happy with it. This has been voted on and there'll be a vote tomorrow. After that vote tomorrow, it's done. Now, one thing I think we need to be aware of, and I agree with you, <coughs> uh, Commissioner Edwards, but at some point in time, the buck stops. And I think it's stopping with us yeah. and we've got to correct it. 
Now, you know, it's a lot of issues that are going to come up yeah. that we've got to deal with. And one thing is when we talk about a hundred and what, 30 some million dollars, folks, at the rate the tax is going up, it's going to be more than that when we reach that point. Uh, we'll have more because this is already higher than what we thought it was. But I think when I look at the agreement, and that's why I voted for it, I think it's a good solution to the problem, and we can correct it going forward. That's what we need to be concerned with. And, you know, if we're going to, you know, do what we need to do as commissioners, let's solve this problem. And I think we're doing that. But just to go and look, we can't go back because it's enough, enough blame to go around to everybody, commissioners, the Buncombe Tech board, you name it. You know, when, you know, I've been on two university boards and we would have never let them build a $15 million parking deck that we didn't need or that's in the wrong place where it could be a good facility there, education building. But let's get this thing done and do it right. And I think what we're doing is the right way to do it and to solve the problem for the county, the college, and for all of us. <laughs> but as commissioners, what we've done in the past, we've tried to make everybody happy. And we let one person do that. And this is where we are. But we've got to take the leadership to do this and to solve this problem. And I think we're on the right track. <clears throat> so does the uh, new county manager have the direction on the 452 we think <laughs> <laughs> well it's i mean part of part of the reason uh and not trying to just relitigate all this part part of the reason i think some of us wanted to take more time at the last meeting was to talk about issues like the four hundred thousand dollars yeah and the other building yeah, but do. the motion to take more time was you know, didn't win. So, did, the, so, so and I think the, the, the issue that's on the agenda tonight is really to just affirm this that's right. clarifying language. Yeah. Regardless of where we all fell on that vote, I think we all agree this is pretty good language. <laughs> um, so yeah, and it, does, it doesn't require a vote. No, no. And, I, and, and you know, and this, this is not a bad discussion no. that we're having at all. And the commission is gonna have an opportunity to be able to move a lot of this forward and you know we're stepping in in a direction and you know, and hopefully i think it's in, in in the right direction and it's going to be flexible you know there's no doubt no doubt about that but i think that needs to be taken care of and so if y'all could you know figure out the, the the number and then bring it back back to us for a vote that would be awesome or in the budget however it's supposed to be done Chairman? Just ma'am. My recommendation would be to have it as part of the budget ordinance when we bring it July 1. Mm -hmm. So it would not be another standalone conversation, but when we come back to you with our full budget plan for the 1920 year, that that allocation, the additional 400 or whatever that number turns out to be after we investigate, we would add that to whatever allocation we would normally give to AB Tech. So you would see that then, and then we can vote on it at that time. So it will be a separate conversation as part of the budget ordinance. Uh, I would be fine with that. I'd be, f I would be fine with that. Um, you know, I, w I would, um, I would also be fine with, with if, if there's the, if there's a, the will on the board to do something on these items sooner than that, I'm also open to that. And I would like to do that. I, I also want to though, just be respectful of kind of our commission protocols. You know, uh, it's always, uh, it's always nice to be on the winning side of a vote. Uh, and and but you know you're not always and I, I, I think we as a person who's uh, wasn't on the majority on that I don't think you should always just keep bringing things back up you know we voted and I want to respect the vote that we had at the last yep. meeting so unless there is uh, a change uh, from one of the folks who voted for this plan I think that, that that this is the plan until we come up with something different yes right yes are there any other comments on this item before we before we move on to the next one Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Fruit. Yes, sir. All right. The next item on the agenda is a consideration of application for grant of franchise to operate ambulances in the county medic. And again, Michael Fruit will lead this off. 
Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, this board voted to uh, direct staff to work with uh, MEDIC, which is Medical Emergency Ambulance Transport, uh, Inc., through its principal, Kermit Tolley, for an agreement for a franchise. Uh, after that meeting, uh, I, I quickly concluded that the best course of action was to comply with our existing uh, emergency services ordinance, which allows for uh, an applicant to come into the county uh, make application and present to staff and uh, staff would present to the board and the board would make specific findings so uh, not quite two weeks ago I did speak with Mr. Tolley he brought in some material he was able to meet with legal staff and let me just go briefly through what's uh, required as part of the application this doesn't happen very often so we don't have a form for an application but there are specific elements that are required to be produced the name and address of the applicant and I'll, I'll summarize through here. Any trade or fictitious names, it is medical emergency ambulance transport, and they do have a valid filing with the Register of Deeds to operate or do business as medic, M-E-D-I-C. Um, a resume of the training experience of the applicant and transportation care for patients. Material responsive to that is included with the application. A description of each ambulance owned or operated by the applicant. There is a listing of seven vehicles, I believe, uh, make and model of the ambulances and age verified with the tax assessor's office that those are listed uh, for taxation uh, with the Buncombe County Assessor. Um, the location and description of the places which is intended to operate, it does have uh, its central locations and please feel free to correct me if I miss any, but I know their home base is at 5 West Haven in Skyland area. Uh, number six, audited financial statement of the applicant as the same pertains to its operations in the county. Uh, received a copy of that, a description of the applicant's capability to provide 24-hour coverage. Uh, the original application wasn't clear on that. Uh, Mr. Freeman asked that uh, Mr. Tolley supplement that. He did and showed some scheduling and hours and how that would operate, and that appears to be responsive. Uh, criminal record uh, check of the directors and managers of the applicant, that is included. Uh, statement of a non-discrimination policy, that is included and inf any information otherwise deemed reasonably necessary and a fee the board has never set a fee so there's no fee for this application <laughs> uh, at this time uh, as of this time there's been one of the things we do need pursuant to the application and the ordinance is an investigation of the equipment and materials and garage spaces of the applicant um, I've spoken with Mr. Jerry Vihan, our EMS director, and he is working with uh, OEMS, Office of Emergency Medical Services out of Raleigh, and they have arranged to do that, and I think that's going to be tomorrow. I'm not positive, but I think they're working to get that accomplished tomorrow. Um, included in your agenda packet, again, is the information that the uh, legal department has reviewed and the elements uh, contained in the application packet are responsive to the ordinance and it would be our recommendation uh, that the board follow the requirements of the ordinance and that uh, a franchise may be granted by this board if the board finds that the public will be served by granting the applicant a franchise the application is accurate and complete the applicant has provided adequate evidence, evidence of its ability to provide safe, adequate, and responsible service. And the applicant holds all necessary licenses and permits from OEMS or will fully qualify to obtain same in the near future. Uh, part of the application process also included the financial statements of the applicant. Uh, shared those with our finance director, uh, Don Warren. Uh, he points out that uh, the financial ratios submitted are based on a year-end 2016 financial statements, and that's what we have. And overall, the financial, I'm going to summarize here, overall the financial ratios of the organization are not a cause for significant concern. The debt ratio is 0 0.64. The closer number is to 1, the more debt burden the organization has, and the ratio is greater than 1 would be a signal of significant problem. But again, he said that overall financial ratios are not a cause of significant concern and that's what i have for you at this time be happy to answer any questions if i can i know mr tolly is here and, and uh brandon freeman is here who reviewed it he would be available also if need be this is for a year right 
the, the, the direction of this board would be uh, to grant a franchise, and at this point it would be if it's consistent, if the board finds that it's consistent with the requirements of the ordinance to grant it for one year. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I have a draft of, uh, of uh, an agreement I hope to share with uh, Mr. Tolley if it's the board's wish. I can do that as early as tomorrow. Uh, just need to make sure that we have some uh, information in there regarding any fees, and that should be consistent with uh, county EMS fees, Medicare, Medicaid billings, which are currently about $850 uh, per ride, I understand. Uh, need to put information uh, requiring or uh, that the county would be able to make inspections of the facilities and property uh, as required or as necessary, and just need to double check on the insurance requirements and I believe he's provided that information, but I need to verify that and that it does name the county as an additional insured. So there's a, there's an application which is on the uh, information on the website, but the actual franchise agreement, um, you've got a draft of it, but it hasn't been finalized uh, yet or shared with uh, Mr. Tolley or. Uh, yeah, yes, basically that is correct. But there's sort of two ways to look at that. Essentially, the board if it makes those four findings, would grant the franchise. With that franchise, we would do an agreement to make sure we're going to operate. I mean, the ordinance doesn't fill every hole that would be required in day-to-day -day operations, the cooperation between the county and the franchisee. So that's what the agreement would be intended to do, day-to-day -day operations, insurance, open books, investigations, et cetera. So would that franchise agreement be, need to be voted on by the county commissioners? Unless this board directs just that uh, with the direction of county legal staff and the manager that we would negotiate it, uh, otherwise it would have to come back to the board if that's your wish. All right. Questions? Okay, so I'm a little bit confused. I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm not confused. Uh, it's my understanding that this was complete except for the successful inspections of uh, OEMS um, on the, uh, the applicant's premises and equipment. Is that accurate? Uh, my interpretation of that, uh, that's correct as far as the ordinance requirements are involved. Um, there's just those other couple of loose ends I would need to work to with uh, Mr. Tolley uh, to clarify and get finalized. I mean, in addition to an agreement that would need to be uh, uh, negotiated and approved, and I don't anticipate much problem with that, um, we'd also need to uh, make sure that we scheduled uh, arrangements with the county IT department to get uh, uh, the required radio equipment put in there, tuned up right, installed properly, and GPS locators. So those are logistics. Those don't necessarily have to be in the contract, do they? I mean, in the franchise agreement. I would just include them in the include. agreement just to make sure everyone knows that that's what we're doing, to just document that. It's not documented in the ordinance, once again. So if I'm wanting to make a motion to support this, how do I, how do, I do that? What do I need to include? Um, because, uh, you know, my understanding is the, is the franchise agreement was um, complete with the exception of the OE, and I'm, I'm OE uh, EMS inspections. And so I, handed I, up a, I handed up a piece of paper to the board. I, you should have it. And oh, it's in the back. Yeah. I have a quick um, question. Who will monitor this for the course of the year? And will there, there be specified check-ins throughout the year? Let me. There is not a specific uh, indication in the ordinance as to how to do that, mm -hmm. but I'd have to work out logistics with uh, Jerry Vihan staff. Okay. Uh, the ordinance simply says that the county may inspect a franchisee's records, premises, and equipment at any time in order to ensure compliance with this article and any franchise uh, granted under this article. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a good question. That's part of why I mean. So, but there Excellent. there is there is a franchise application, mm -hmm. but there is not a franchise agreement that exists yet that any of us have seen. And it sounds like it's it's in some ways it's pretty. Um, and I don't mean this in a in a negative way, Michael, but just kind of you know, pretty bare bones in a way. I mean, pretty simple. It's not. It doesn't sound like what you're contemplating has a lot of 
you know, frankly, a lot of regulations in terms of how this would be run, they would have a fairly free hand in terms of how, how they would run it. I mean, they're, they're, they don't report to the county. They don't, they're not like the fire districts. They don't have a, an elected board that they report to. It's a for-profit entity, and they would, you know, there wouldn't be a lot of regulations around how they operate under that franchise. That the county would be, it sounds like a very simple document you're talking about, not a lot of regulations on how it would be it's 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 modeled on the agreement we have with all the 16 volunteer fire departments it's a shorter okay. version of the same and i think commissioner belcher sort of nailed it i mean we were talking about administrative loose ends to get this accomplished mm -hmm. so would uh, uh, section 22-43 granting this one two three and four plus the oems with the uh, inspection being able to pass that would that would that allow us to I vote on this? I didn't keep myself a copy, but that, are there three things written on the you, back you of that? You can certainly approach a bench if you want to. There's, there's the four highlighted criteria, and then there's three yeah, things you wrote okay. on the back. You know, why are you looking at that? I'm trying to move it along. So yeah. I've got a, one concern, though, here. And this is, we, boy, we've dragged, this has been... I got a long time ever since I've been on the board over two years now we've been talking about this but I have one concern though here could we set a bad precedent if we start giving away our right to approve a franchise agreement I mean in if we're going to do a franchise agreement not only to protect the county and the tallies I want to see, uh, shouldn't we approve that and come before the commissions? I, I think so. Because what happens if we start just giving and not no, I knocking understand. you, yeah. Michael, but if we just start giving him our authority to do the franchise agreements, and that's what we're saying. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how to write a franchise agreement. So what I was expecting to do this evening was to, uh, to um, approve a, a franchise agreement upon certain inspections. Um, so I'm a little frustrated that I don't have a franchise agreement. Yeah, that's. I'm just. Well, I think the first step would be granting the franchise conditional upon the successful inspection. And I would that's where I that's where I was going. okay yeah it, that's only it. if there's a, six, a, a successful inspection would it advance to the agreement stage okay Is that's that, perfectly reasonable okay all right hang on a minute sorry what's that that's perfectly reasonable way to do it yeah is that a motion that was not a motion I was that, just trying to that sounds like my motion <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where I was trying to get to so I'm gonna make that motion what you just said all right, there's a motion to approve the franchise application, um, and it's contingent upon the inspection. Yes. Um, it's with the understanding that there will also be development of a franchise agreement that will be reviewed by the board. And just to be sure, the, the motion, if, if Commissioner Belser's motion would need to be that uh, a move to approve a franchise for Medic and the as the board does find that the public will be served by granting the applicant a franchise, the application is accurate and complete. The applicant has provided adequate evidence of its ability to provide safe, adequate, and responsible service, and the applicant holds all necessary licenses and permits from OEMS contingent upon passing an inspection by the Office of OEMS. So I make that motion. Then from that, it would move to um, the agreement to come back to the board. So that would be it. A motion is that right yep I, I want to get it right so I think and as long I, as you're accepting everything that mr. Frew just spelled out yes, as I part am. of the motion yeah. yes you know all right there's a motion is there a second a second okay further discussion we will vote on we will uh, take public comment on this um, yeah, any so other questions from the board yeah. okay. thanks for yeah. thanks for yeah. bringing that up hmm? yeah, you do, right, that's yeah, we will. Yeah. I have one question. So um, when we've talked about this before, there was discussion about a nonprofit organization, but 
this uh, franchise agreement would actually be with a, the, a for-profit company, not a non-profit company. Is that correct? Uh, that's the way I'm, I'm reviewing the application. I mean, the first page uh, comes from Medic, and that's the uh, doing business as assumed name, certificate of assumed name on file for medical emergency ambulance transport. Uh, Secretary of State records show that medical emergency ambulance transport is a North Carolina for-profit corporation. And that's who the franchise ag agreement is with, is with a for-profit company, not with a nonprofit entity. Correct. I just want to make sure we're really clear on who, who, who is getting this agreement, right? Yeah, it's, the agreement so. would, the franchise would be with the applicant that owns the assets to provide the service. And the applicant and the ambulance services or the ambulances themselves are owned okay. by. And that's Medical Emergency Ambulance Transport Incorporated. Yes, sir. Okay. Question? All right. Um, let's go ahead and take public comment on this. Thank you, Mr. Freel. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on the motion? We'll start with you, and then we'll do Mr. Yelton, and then I'll go to the back. Go ahead. And uh, please share your name and uh, where you live. I'm Don Copenhaver. Uh, I recently retired, but had 25 years with three Buncombe County employers, manufacturers, and a huge warehouse. Um, and we had experience as an HR and safety director and the um, Buncombe County uh, EMS and uh, fire departments do an excellent job of responding in a timely manner. Um, I've actually ridden in the Swannanoa EMS vehicle to uh, the beacon uh, door that we need to go into and so forth. So I want to thank that group and they do an excellent job. I also want to thank the council uh, commission for adding four um, paramedics. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, my concern, uh, and uh, I don't know medic in the group per se, is their $850 calls that they make will take away from the county uh, calls and the county funding uh, for that service that the county is currently providing. Um, and again, I don't know medic's service or not, uh, but that's a concern I have that um, what door are we opening and how much is that door going to open? I can't answer that, but that's a concern. Uh, you did answer one question just now on the one year of the contract. It says five on the website. Um, I attended a meeting on February 6th with three of the commissioners, and we discussed this at, at length, had open discussion uh, concerning uh, how it, uh, the franchise would operate, and so that was one of the uh, issues. Also, they, uh, we got a commitment to have in there was where the uh, vehicles would be uh, stationed, and uh, so that you know, I would hope that would also be in the uh, uh, franchise, um, and we'd like I'd like to take the thank the three board members that attended that meeting in the Fairview uh, Fire Department. Uh, uh, I have no, I'm, I'm at closer to Skyland because of the Hubble uh, relationship. So um, the concern is how much revenue are we going to lose as a county, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Yelton. First and foremost, I hope I see this much scrutiny when we do an arrangement with the 5013C, because I ain't never seen that in 20 some years of watching this board. So I hope I see it. I'll be looking for it. Number two, if a company for profit can operate at the same price that the county's charging. Who's taking money from who? It means somebody is doing it more efficient. And I strongly suggest you look at more franchise agreements to open up doors for competition, if you really believe in competition. Because you may find something that can come from a franchise that would improve the total service to the county at a lower cost. Isn't that amazing? What would be wrong with that? So what's wrong with giving these folks a franchise? And you want everything spelled out. How are you going to spell it out until after you inspect it, until after you see the facilities, and until after you decide where you're going to hold them and to what territory you're going to hold them to? You've already discussed that a little bit. 
So the next step is you have to take this in steps. I hear steps all along up there. Well, we can't decide tonight. We've got to do a step. So what's wrong with taking this first step? Because if you draw up an agreement that this company does not want to agree to, they have the right to refuse, don't they? So if you draw up your agreement properly and what you really want, there's no doubt that they will sign the franchise agreement. So again, remember, I want to see this much scrutiny on any agreement with any 5013C because I saw 2.2 million given away on the excitement of standing up here talking about it's a great deal. And I got a little bit of glimmer of hope when I heard somebody mention budget and 20 year budget because that's guess how the county has got to be run. Just like I run my house. You have a budget and you live by that budget. And if somebody can offer some service in a little area at the same price you're offering it for and make a profit, I think you better be studying what they're doing. And by the way, Danielle, Jupiter, North Carolina. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the back who raised his hand earlier. Oh, you're in the front now. You snuck up. All yeah, right. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Dan Friday. I'm a <coughs> resident of Buncombe County. I'd like to share with you some things I've learned about medic ambulance service. First, extending a franchise to the Opportunity Medic will open the Pandora's box. It will open Buncombe County up to any other for-profit service that wants to operate within its boundaries, companies like Rural Metro and AMR. Second, Buncombe County looks to lose a considerable amount in revenue. Third, giving Medic a franchise to operate in the county will make the county el ineligible for many federal grants. There's a possibility that this will trickle down to local fire departments as well. Um, it is my understanding that the contract will include a clause that states the medic will be able to accept a call or not. This means that if 911 dispatches a medic unit um, and they're sitting in the parking lot across the street from, from where the call is going to take place, that they can deny that call and another unit would then need to be dispatched from further away. This could easily cause an avoidable death. Um, they do not, uh, medic does not staff every ambulance with a paramedic. I've talked to several people in the industry that have stated that Kermit will meet an ambulance at the hospital so that there is a paramedic with the patient when they roll through the doors. I've also been told by a person who, wor who worked for medic under conditions of anonymity that he was asked as an EMT intermediate to pose as a paramedic. They do not keep up currently with their own contract word workload at the VA. Um, they leave Riceville Fire Department to handle their slack. They have lied to the commissioners as soon as the last meeting when they stated that they had eight ambulances. They actually have seven. One is a pickup truck. The rumor is that some of their ambulances will not meet the standards of, uh, by OEM. No longer rumor. Their newest ambulance is out of registration. It expired on a 30-day tag, and I've got a picture of it. It's running around on a 30-day tag. It expired in November of last year. Um, they, um, they have a current complaint against them for an incident ha happening at, another, at an assisted living facility. Medics show up to, pa to a patient in severe distress, in need of IV fluids, and possibly going into sepsis. The medic staff should have picked up the patient and taken off to the hospital. Instead, they force the staff to find a nurse practitioner to have her sign a medical necessity form that would take this patient, and, and it added an, estimate, an estimated 15 to 25 minutes to their on-site time. Um, lastly, or, no, we also do not need them because the, the, Keith, the Keith Boss um, report to this board says that you all don't need them. Lastly, several fire departments could not be here today. Their boards and chiefs were threatened by the three commissioners pushing this medic franchise. They were threatened that if they spoke out against this franchise agreement, they would have their budgets and funding cut. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Any other members of the public who wish to comment? <clears throat> sure. Come on, Mr. Tolley. Good afternoon. I'm Kermit Tolley. Y'all know me. I would like to respond to some of these allegations. Um, obviously, all these are very fictitious I'm sorry obviously the allegations against medic my department 
are fictitious. Statement number one, at any time an EMS or ambulance agency may apply for a Buncombe County franchise. That's been in place for years. The ambulance ordinance exists. Anybody that wants to can come in here and apply for that. Statement number two, there is no possible way to project any loss or gain since we've, we're already doing this service. There'll be no change in what we're doing. I don't think there's a way that we would affect anybody's funding. Every fire department in Buncombe County is an independent organization. What my corporation does has no bearing on any other corporation. We have a primary station which is located in Neighbors Creek, and I know what this gentleman is referring to. We were called by Buncombe County 911 to stand by at the Valley Springs Skyland Station because a Buncombe County unit was out of service so we could service that area. We did have permission from Skyland's fire chief prior to responding to that location to make sure it was okay. Uh, Skyland's fire chief did write a letter indicating the same. Regarding choosing to accept or deny a call, Every responder in Buncombe County has a duty to act. It is illegal not to respond to a call. We cannot do that. It doesn't matter what kind of person it is, and we have always responded to those calls. There was a remark against our response to the hurricanes down east. Uh, you have four different letters, the first one being from North Carolina Emergency Management. There was no allegations against medic. All of those welcome us to come back and they're, they, we were very successful with those missions. Uh, under general statute, credential personnel are required. The minimum requirement on an ambulance was an emergency medical responder and an EMT. We've held the VA contract for 31 years. Um, you have two different documents where we have ex exceeded extraordinary measures with the VA. Time's up, uh, Mr. Dolly. That's fine. You have the information. If there's any questions, give me a call. Okay. I'm Sharon Tolly. Have been with Medic for 31 years. We have operated in this county 31 years. This is nothing new to us, you all know that. We're not coming in here from another state, starting a new ambulance service. We've been here that long. Talking about picking up people that, or, or not being able to respond to people that you don't know or park somewhere and somebody falls out. And Saturday, Last Saturday, I went on a shopping trip to Walmart. I heard something across the room, and this person was desperately coughing. I mean, terrible. I thought it was an older person. So I immediately take my buggy, and I go hunt it. Where was this coming from? I got with this young girl. She was having an asthma attack. I called 911, you know, that's the second time I've ever called 911 in my life. But I called 911. I didn't know who I was going to get. Didn't matter. The woman was choking. I needed her head, uh, I needed help. I took her to the front of the store and my ambulance came. Buncombe County EOC sent them. When their Buncombe County EOC tells them where to park their units early in the morning and midday and late at night. And when the closest ambulance can go to the person, there it is. Okay, we, my two guys got this lady, put her in the ambulance, put her in the back, and they treated her with a, a, a oxygen and a, a breathing treatment is what she needed. 
Well, at that point, she can either go to the hospital or she can refuse. Well, she didn't want to go because she didn't have any insurance. After they'd given her all this treatment and everything, they helped her out of the back of the ambulance. And her mom picked her up, and she went home. So does that sound like somebody that would turn somebody down? I would never. One of the things in this county that we did when we first got started, just to get started, we took any child down to Chapel Hill that had to have more treatment, free. We took them free, not because we you know, had all this rolling money, but we let the, the family ride with that child. And that was the way we got all our calls for Mission Hospital. Thank you. I think my time's up. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Tanya Gibson with Medic. But at, with Riceville doing our contract calls with the VA, I can absolutely assure you they don't. The only VA transports that they might do, it's not contract. When anyone falls, when anyone falls outside on the parking lot, that's not a contract VA call. And they should absolutely call 911 for the closest ambulance. That's what anybody should do. And <coughs> those patients should absolutely have the closest truck, just like anyone else. And I believe that that's what should be done with anybody. If my truck is sitting downtown and there's a truck across the street, which one would you rather send? The closest truck, which would be the uh, Riceville's truck. And I believe that's true as well. So, but that's not a contract patient. So I just wanted to clarify a few things like that, because that's the things that I deal with every day. All right, thank you. No, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Just get one bite at the apple. So, all right, anybody else? All right, uh, bring it back to the commission for further discussion. <coughs> I do. I do have a couple of follow-up questions, though. So. And I guess I'll go to Mr. Fru first and might ask some other folks if, um, for their thoughts. On this. So on this question about if this is uh, approved, is Medic Inc. required to transport uh, people on, on every call? Are they required to provide the transportation? Uh, that's that's what's in my draft uh, for the agreement. I understand that uh, George Wood met with Mr. Tolley a couple months ago, and they discussed uh, how the the how the service might be provided, what assurances of service would be included, and that's uh, when uh, they they discussed putting GPS on the trucks. Then they'd be equipped just like uh, any other emergency apparatus that operates this service for the county. So if they're directed by EMS to be stationed at corner X, Y, and Z, that's where they would be stationed. Uh, unless they're, if they're in service, they have to reply. If they're out of service, that is, they're responding to some call already or they're already out of service at the hospital or transporting, then, you know, they can't. They wouldn't be called. So, so it might be a requirement in the agreement. It is. It should be. It should be. Okay. Because I've, I've heard different, you know, I've heard it different ways. Like that, yes. that, that may or may not be required. So good. And on this question about the vehicles being where they're going to be stationed. Um, staging. staging. That, that's, that's the same point. I mean, where they would be staged, it'd be staged uh, is, I understand the plan, where EMS would ask them to be staged. Okay. And that'll be in the franchise agreement that they must follow that direction and they must stage their vehicles where directed and only in those places is that is that the well plan? again I, I think uh, there's other personnel here that could explain better but i think sometimes a vehicle would be in route from point a to point b they might end up being the closest that's part of the purpose in the ems system through the 911 out of the castle they try to get the closest mm -hmm. person so that might be may not be the staged place it might be they're going back to that stage from the hospital for instance but essentially yes Okay. There is a caveat to that. 
Okay. Well, thank you. You know, I think those are um, those are just really that's part of why I would like to see the agreement come back. Because I think the details of that stuff, you know, if these are requirements or or just I'm or just sort of, you know, how how tight that agreement is uh, is important. So I don't have any other questions about it right now. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, understand now we're voting on to get these three things on the back right now, right? Well, Those three the, items the would be, yes, uh, they yes. are incorporated in the motion. That's yep. already motion. Yes. Well, the yes. agreement, the yes. agreement's yes. coming back. And then we're going to have a contract to vote on next, right? If all goes according to plan, yes, sir. But I thought I just heard a while ago there was no contract yet. No agreement. You know, and then someone has seen one online that's a five year instead of a one year. I don't know where And they then Brownie just brought up and you said yes, that is in the contract. <laughs> so I'm kind of confused. <laughs> the, Are they a contract or not? Currently no. Currently the nothing. Or, the ordinance, nothing online or anything. Not in terms of the contract. Where are we seeing this? Well, the, where the, you're ordinance, seeing, where the, you're ordinance, the ordinance, excerpts of the ordinance are online. The ordinance allows a franchise up to five years. Okay. It's the direction I've received from this board and the <laughs> county manager to proceed toward a one-year franchise. That's right. Okay. That's where that comes from. Okay. What was put before us originally that we voted on, that was part of it, that the five years was there, but it was a one-year deal. It was sent back to change that you couldn't stage areas or, or move areas. That's what you were instructed okay. to do in, in that ordinance to be brought back to us. That's never been brought back to us. We have a totally different deal tonight that, you know, it's uh, the main thing is it's gone. If they, they pass the OMC, I guess that's the thing. I gave you the sheet then that's all good then everything that they have as far as the franchise we're voting on the franchise that's all good we're giving them one year to make sure that everything's right instead of five years to make it you know the way it works so we're trying an area that way we can figure out if it does hurt anybody in the county but they have two places they stage now that their main office that's after at night most of the time and they have a place over in town over here. I can't remember the address. We're not doing anything different. We're just trying to get them legal. They work for us anyway. Why not, you know, I, I don't understand why we don't want to make them legal to work for us. That's, and you know, if there's two ambulances down today and they asked them to put two on, they do. Excuse me. But it's, uh, Let's just get this part done, see what OMA says. If they, they disagree with the tallies, then they disagree with them. We're looking at how this will work out in the whole process. I have received all kinds of stuff in emails, and especially from the gentleman with they're sitting on the front row, that they all these things that they didn't have, well, they do. The Everything, we, we have the emails, too, from the people from Skyland, from all the people down on the coast that they accepted their, and, and they really responded very well. And it wasn't just what you're condemning to that west coast or down in the east coast, down in the area for the hurricane. There was three different people or areas working with them. I don't know the counties, but there's three other counties down there working. So I guess they're all bad too. I guess everything that they do is wrong in the process. If we see something that's wrong in the six months process of this deal, I'll be one of the first to stop it. I promise you that. They're just asking to get radios turned on. The franchise gets the radios turned on too for them that everybody else has got. They have them. It's not that they have to install them. They've been in there for a long time, ever since Viper come out. But it's just turn them on. That way y'all can hear what they have to do and where they're being sent. That way nobody can say they're out riding around trying to get work. 
and uh, that's plain and simple. But, you know, when you make allegations against people, that's not good. If you don't have the facts, you got a problem, and I think you got a problem. So, Chairman, can I have the uh, motion read? Uh, well, I got another. All right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, can we call Kermit or anyone back up to ask a him a question? Give a question, yeah. Well, I'd like to ask Mr. Friday come up and restate what you said about three commissioners threatening that they would – that – I hope you've got proof of that. Um, <laughs> I hope I, you've got actually proof. Actually, I have um, I have witnesses that were at the meeting. It was an open uh, board meeting. Uh, I've been asked not to mention anybody's name because they're all worried that you guys are going to cut their funding just like you promised that you would. Joe Bell, I mean. Okay, so y'all can talk about this all night if you want yeah, to. No, but I just want uh, to. I bet, so I, and I, I personally don't see it going going anywhere. Some of them, I would like to have the motion restated um, and um, for clarity purposes. I'd like, I'd like to have the motion restated. Michael, so that we're clear, please. I'm going to restate what you understand to be the motion. Yeah. So this would be a motion to approve granting of the franchise to medical emergency ambulance transport as the application has been received and the board finds that the public will be served by granting the applicant a franchise consistent with this article. The application is accurate and complete. The applicant has provided adequate evidence of its ability to provide safe, adequate, and responsible service and evidence that no owner, operator, agent, or employee or applicant has been debarred from the Medicare or Medicaid program. The applicant holds all necessary licenses and permits from OEMS or will fully be qualified to obtain all necessary license upon award of the franchise. Um, and this uh, award is contingent upon uh, satisfactory inspection of all medic facilities and ambulances by OEMS and that staff is directed to negotiate on a uh, franchise agreement to bring back to the board in a couple weeks. So Mr. Chairman to protect the decorum of this uh, this chamber uh, I'm gonna call the question unless another commissioner has a comment mm -hmm. uh, so that we can vote on this. Are there any commissioners who haven't commented on the motion who would like to comment? Um, okay, I'd like to make just one final comment. I am gonna vote against the motion. I voted against it before. I'm just I'm still in the same place. <laughs> the um, to me, the um, the main reason I'm gonna vote against it is that I do have a significant concern that um, creating a you know that uh, creating a for-profit franchise will undermine the system of public uh, emergency response agencies that we have in the county because there are only there's a there's a certain number of calls that are going to happen every year for folks who need this service and if um, if a greater percentage of those calls get taken by the for-profit entity the only way these agencies have money is through uh, the revenues they generate from providing services and the tax the tax money that we as taxpayers invest if their revenues are cut into by the for-profit entity that means they have less funding to operate their organizations and they have to pay their staff they have to pay for their equipment and less funding for the volunteer fire districts um, means uh, it will degrade their services over time um, unless we raise taxes if we raise the tax rates for those districts that could compensate for that but if we're going to raise the tax rates in the fire districts, I would much rather it be to actually improve the level of service um, uh, of those districts rather than just raising taxes to keep it um, the same as it is today. So for those reasons, I'm going to vote against it. With that said, when the, the, when the, if it is going to go into effect, then I think the details of this, this agreement are really important. So I do look forward to talking about some of the details of that, even though I'm, I'll probably still vote against it. But I, I hope that you know we can you work out some of those issues when, when it comes back. So thank you for your consideration all in okay. favor well, right. okay all right one more all well right. La last last try. We, keep walking, try. we keep on walking in a circle here so Kermit or medic has been doing this for my three years here so what happens if 
medic just says, hey, you're not going to give me this franchise, and they quit taking these, uh, what is it, 107 calls average a month. How are we going to staff enough fire and EMS to take care of this? Well, I guess I, mean, I guess if, if you're asking them. me that question, <laughs> yeah, Commissioner Presley, I would I would say if you know it's if you if you're going to say they're already doing this, then another question would be, well, if they're already doing this, then why is this agreement needed? One if it's the status quo, go ahead. Radio, because they're having to go. Mm -hmm. I'm having to go through Jasmine to talk to you. You got to go back through Jasmine to talk to me. That's that's what all this is about. Well, I think. Part of part of I guess part of my perspective on this, and I'm not an attorney, so we got Michael Frew and Heather Hockaday to help advise on this stuff. But if they uh, if they do receive an approved actual legal franchise agreement with Buncombe County, I believe they will have additional rights as a business entity to operate under that 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 don't exist today. So I think that. Um, which again, the, the people can agree to disagree about whether that's a good thing, but um, they would have additional rights that don't exist today without the franchise. And, 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 and it, to expand, you know, to not just do what they're doing today, but to possibly expand it, unless there's, unless, unless there's provisions in the agreement that place limits and regulations on how it's operated, it could be expanded um, in ways that could be undermining to the, uh, the volunteer fire districts in the county. So the, uh, again, I think the details of how that's going to work are all, you know, very important. I mean, because there's no guarantee it's, it's just going to always be operated the way it has been in the past. Um, if they have an approved legal franchise agreement with Buncombe County, they will have the right as a business to do whatever they're allowed under that. And if there's not a lot of details that limit that, it's fairly open-ended. But that's what we just talked about. They are going to be details that he will be called up on needed well let's see that that's what's <laughs> going to be in the contract we've well, still never seen it and i'm not blaming the staff for that i think they've worked hard to get the things together for this meeting that are here and there's just some more time needed to to prepare those documents i believe so that's what we're directing them to do is what you just said so i'm going to call the question right. one more time all in favor of the motion please say aye aye, aye. aye. those opposed say aye aye, aye. It passes four to three all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Frew. Yes, sir. <clears throat> All right, we come to new business. And we're going to be discussing consideration of approval of a resolution authorizing execution of contracts and agreements involving Inca Center and Sports Park. And Tim Love is going to help us out on this one. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, at this time, uh, Josh O'Connor, our Recreation Services Director, is going to join me up front and uh, may call Michael Frew as well to provide some legal guidance. Um, today we are considering uh, two re formal requests of the Board. Uh, one is to authorize uh, agreements and move forward with those. Get in that mic because this is really good stuff. I'm in. So our secondary uh, request is for additional consideration on parking lot lighting at Bob Lewis Ballpark. Uh, in your packet, you have a number of memos or two memos, uh, a total of six agreements, and then a resolution that I'll ask you to approve uh, later on. Uh, to facilitate this discussion, though, I would like to bring up a PowerPoint's presentation. Yay. Thank you, Max. All right, so request number one today. So we're, we are requesting that the Board of the County Commissioners approve the resolution authorizing the Chairman to execute the following agreements. Um, in that packet, there are uh, six agreements. Uh, those include a agreement with the TDA, which is a reimbursable grant agreement. Additionally, there is a usage and operating agreement with EYSO that defines public purpose for fields uh, operated by EYSO. Additionally, there's a greenway and operating easement ag agreement. Uh, this basically sets up the transfer of parcels uh, to Buncombe County um, for use for the greenway. In addition, there is an additional agreement between EYSO and Buncombe County that grants the easement that's required to construct that greenway. And finally, there are two Musco lighting contracts, and those two agreements are in your packet. One is for Bob Lewis Ballpark, the other is for the Buncombe County Sports Park. Uh, just a quick note on history. This project in, was brought to you in 2014. 
there's been a lot of progress since then, uh, culminating in last year's opening of the Bob Lewis ballparks, as well as the approval of the TDA TPDF $6 million grant fund. In terms of the project itself, you've heard about this a number of times, so I will not spend much time, but just to refresh the audience, uh, the, the total Inca Recreation Destination Project is a $12 million project that includes funding sources from the TDA as well as the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners at $1.2 million, and finally the Federal Highway Agency at $4.8 million. There are a number of things that will happen with this project. I will not read the slide to you, but I will tell you that, that there will be an Anka Heritage Trail. In addition, there will be updates at the Buncombe County Sports Park, and finally, updates at Bob Lewis Ballpark as well. Uh, primarily, primarily, the updates at the ballparks will include turfing and lighting, which is key to recruiting tournaments to our area. <coughs> This is an overview of the Anka Recreation Project. Again, not gonna spend a lot of time here, you've seen this, but it gives you an idea of the overall layout and where the Anka Heritage Trail will meet with different amenities, including ballparks, um, as well as, as, well as uh, additional amenities, such as uh, restrooms and dog parks. And I think that, uh, it, sorry. I think it would, it is repetitious for us to hear it, but I think it is, it's, it's okay to, um, which would be very quick there there i think there are like 14 i don't know if josh is going to do this or not um go through the 14 assets that that are part of that um i think it'd be good information for those that are here that haven't heard it before absolutely and, and i would pivot to josh who if you could come up and sort of walk through those quick assets thanks i was afraid i put the tie on for nothing um, I, 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 yeah, I was going to call you out. That. You're welcome. Um, so the first thing we've got uh, is the three turf fields. Uh, those are tournament quality turf fields capable of holding 11 versus 11 uh, soccer matches. We also have lighting for those turf fields, which will allow us to extend uh, playability uh, by f at least five months um, at Buncombe County Sports Park, as well as adding those nighttime hours. Um, unfortunately, due to the damage at the John B. Lewis soccer complex, we're now moving a lot of um, practices to the Buncombe County Sports Park to offset that load, and I believe uh, Mike from ABYSA uh, will provide some background on how much of that load we're holding now. Uh, we're also going to add 4,000 feet of linear surface trails to help with park circulation, handicap accessible accessibility upfits, so that uh, for both new and old components of this project, we will allow more of our citizens to be able to access that. Uh, additional parking, uh, a challenge course, which is a fit fitness course uh, that will allow um, folks to compete against one another. Uh, we're hoping to uh, integrate that through social media so they'll be able to compete with sites around the country. Um, a Yelp court, which is a four-way uh, indoor-outdoor uh, court hybrid that can be reprogrammed for a number of sports, and it's designed around the idea of accessibility and inclusivity, uh, a sports agility course, uh, just to uh, complement both large-scale athletic facilities that we have out there um, and focus on a kind of uh, birth to retirement uh, mentality for fitness, uh, picnic pavilion with restrooms and Wi-Fi capability up at our current orchard um, area to create some new educational opportunities, a dog park, and then um, displacing our current community play space within the sports park with a new recreational quality uh, field outside of the sports park that will be connected by the Greenway. Um, the Inca Heritage Trail will include two bridge crossings over Hominy Creek, um, and two miles of greenway. And with the Bob Lewis ballpark, we have the, uh, the seven lighting sets, which will allow them to extend their playability uh, and tournament offerings by at least 30%. One of those uh, um, utilizes a uh, old railroad trestle, isn't it? Isn't that, it? That's correct. We're gonna be repurposing very the, cool. the railroad trestle that went into the Inca plant. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful trestle, it goes right over Hominy Creek, and hopefully we can uh, add some fishing and some other activities to that as well. Thank you. You didn't waste that time, buddy. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you, Josh. Uh, if no other questions, I'll, I'll continue moving forward in the presentation. Uh, real quickly, our, our timeline for the project, just want to make sure everyone understands where we're at and uh, where we're going. Uh, project conclusion on the far right would be July 2022. Um, that is, of course, barring any setbacks in timing. 
based on your authorization this evening of the agreements we placed in front of you, uh, that would allow us to move forward with the, the near-term milestones of October 2019 and May 2019 to get life in, excuse me, lighting installed at Bob Lewis and uh, the Buncombe County Sports Park, respectively. So did, did I read that correct, that Buncombe County Sports Park turfing is in October? When is the turfing happening on the sports park? Getting the lighting nailed down, nailed down is the first step because that frees up the funding. It's really going to depend on how fast we can activate contracts for engineering and when we choose to displace the soccer season. Okay. I think there's some decisions to be made there in terms of how many fields we're pulling offline and what we can afford to pull offline um, with our current capabilities. And that's not just looking at ours, that's looking at the cities and, and soccer overall. So we want to be careful about when we activate that. And that'll be a conversation that we hold pretty closely with the soccer community. Because you're staging that and you want to make sure the community has access to the fields, you're not going to go in there and shut down a bunch of fields and then try to do a bunch of work. You still want to. Correct. And, and we also, uh, one of the ways that we maintain Buncombe County Sports Park is to recruit um, tournaments during the off season that include lacrosse and things that normally don't play during soccer season. So we don't want to launch this project in the middle of those commitments. Yeah, so how, how big was that lacrosse tournament that, you, I mean, you had a lacrosse tournament there last spring? Fall. It was huge. Yeah, it was over, it was over 100 teams and generated um, over 2,500 hotel room nights. Yeah, it was a big and deal. There's a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. All right, moving forward. So an overview of our agreements. I've spoken to you at a high level about these. This table displays each of the agreements, the purpose of the agreement, the estimated value if there is a value. Um, in some places it's not applicable. And the entities that would be engaging in the agreements. So I'll summarize very quickly for you. Again, all of these agreements are in your packet. They've been reviewed by our legal, uh, our finance, our recreation services, as well as the stakeholders on the other side of these agreements. So uh, EYSO, Fletcher Partners, ENCA Partners, et cetera. Uh, the TDA grant agreement, again, this establishes the reimbursable relationship between us and the TDA to move forward on the $6 million project. Uh, that means that we will pay and then ask for reimbursement. Uh, the EYSO Usage and Operating Agreement. This defines public purpose for use of the fields. Uh, the Greenway Easement Grant. This defines the parcels that will be transferred so that we can construct the Enca Heritage Trail. The agreement between EYSO and Buncombe County. Uh, this establishes the terms of the easement uh, in the future that would be granted to Buncombe County to construct that greenway. Uh, we, then we, we then have two Musco lighting agreements. These are direct bids that we received on a purchase agreement. Uh, one is for Bob Lewis Ballpark for $1.3 million. The other $565,000 for uh, the Buncombe County Sports Park. Are there any questions on these agreements? We have a usage agreement, which means the public will be able to use the ball fields for a plus or minus number of hours, correct? That is correct. Uh, we've defined a certain number of days um, or evenings that would be used for uh, open for public use through recreation services. In addition, we built into the agreement an annual check-in between EYSO and recreation services, which would define the upcoming year's schedule. Um, so if we see that we need additional time, that would be the time to sort of begin that negotiation. If we see that we need less time, that way as well. Any additional questions on the agreements? Right. So our recommendation as staff is that you move forward with the ENCO Recreation Project by authorizing the chairman of the board to execute these agreements. Um, as a quick note, we shared with you earlier, there is one agreement where there are some minor changes that we would like to make. Um, we would ask that you authorize the chairman to approve those changes as well. Um, if there are any changes that impact cost, uh, we would bring that back before the board, but we do not anticipate that happening. Our goal today is to authorize these agreements, if the board is so willing, so that we do not have to bring these agreements back before the board so that we can move forward with the project. I don't have any questions. I would, just a comment. Um, I know there's been a lot of work put into this God, over many months. Over the last, uh, thanks. Uh, especially over the, over the last few weeks preparing for this, so I just want to say thanks to the to you, Tim, and Michael, and everyone, Josh, and everyone with the county staff who've been working on this, because there's a lot of different parts to this, and we want to make sure we're, we're putting it all in place. 
um, as, as the funding is actually about to begin, you know, we're about to start making these significant investments. So thank you to you and the property owners and all the other partners who've been involved in kind of pulling this together so that we can uh, be prepared to act on it tonight. Thank you. Um, let's take public comment, uh, and uh, we're going to have we're going to need to vote on each of these uh, uh, items separately, I believe. Or, or no, it's, in it's in one resolution, and as Tim okay. explained, it gives the chair the opportunity, if okay. need be, to make any changes consistent with the board's action. So, if we approve the as resolution, as we we're in essence approving all of the separate agreements as part of it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right, are there any public comments on the, uh, this item? Yes, sir. And then um, come to you next. My name is Mike Rachikob. I'm the executive director of Asheville Buncombe Youth Soccer Association. I'm here this evening to represent our organization and the Asheville Buncombe Adult Soccer Association and to encourage you to move forward with the ambitious Inca Recreation Destination Project. It represents the largest investment in recreation by Buncombe County in over a decade, and we want to applaud your commitment to increasing the opportunities for children, adults, and families in our community. In our fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018, ABYSA and ABASA served 7,905 unique participants in our recreation and competitive soccer programs. The only po this was only possible through important partnerships that we have with Buncombe County and the City of Asheville who provide critical field resources for our programs. Buncombe County Sports Park is an essential asset that is currently underutilized due to the limitations of the natural grass playing surfaces and the lack of sports field lighting. The planned improvements at Buncombe County Sports Park will immediately increase the number of hours and days that our youth and adult participants can engage in vigorous exercise. It will allow the program growth and expansion and will help us to make even larger contributions to the variety of businesses that benefit from sports tourism. Our programs have grown year over year for two decades, but that growth has been muted over the last five years due to limited play space. In 2018, there were 12 weekends of tournaments that utilized Buncombe County Sports Park and other facilities that generated 9,677 documented hotel room night stays. The Inca Destination Project is a great example of a public-private partnership that will benefit citizens and businesses alike. And it's a great example of the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority's promotion of the idea that tourism builds community. We are excited to be partners in this project and excited to deliver to the community the benefits that this project offers our mutual constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Um, my name is Emily Sutton Desio. I'm here on behalf of Connect Inca. Connect Inca is a nonprofit um, group that supports connectivity and walkability of our community. We started years ago, I think probably 2012, with our walk to, and bike to school days. Um, this Inca Heritage Trail really has the ability to connect Sand Hill Elementary School, Inca Intermediate School, potentially Inca High School and Hominy Valley Elementary School to uh, a trail system and to the park. I do really support the accountability and the transparency, transparency of having these these agreements in writing so that they're binding on future commissions on you and as we grow um, looking at the timeline it's important that we make sure that what you decide today doesn't get changed by a future board we applaud you and support the construction of the Inca Heritage Trail we applaud you and support the construction of the bridge across the Hominy Creek to connect soccer and baseball fields as the mother of a 10 year old who plays travel ball I especially like the public um, use um, declaration it's really exciting to have this park in our backyard. I can personally attest to the, the income <laughs> and tourism as we travel to all of the other um, communities, yeah. Johnson City, Greenville, um, and, and spend a lot of money when, when doing the travel ball. <laughs> um, it is my hope also as the Vice President of Inca Candler Business Association that the park will attract restaurants to the Candler community. 
The only complaint I would have is that the construction of the Heritage Trail is the last in line and not being built concurrently with the other projects. And I don't like that it necessarily starts at the end. I, I would really like to see it start at the beginning. There's really no reason. It's not um, designed in the design phase. It doesn't lay in, in opposition or in the way of your soccer fields or the lights or the bridge. It can be done at the same time. And so to wait and put that at the end makes me worried that that would be the thing that gets cut if we run out of money. So I would, I would encourage you to consider asking that it be built concurrent and not waiting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Emily. On that. My name is uh, Glenn Satterfield. I live in Inca Village, which is a community directly across the street from Jacob Home and adjacent to the ballpark. I've lived in the same home for 24 years. I moved here from Charlotte in 1995 raised my three grown children, and hopefully my uh, first grandchild is gonna be here in July, and they will s also spend numerous hours in my home and in the community there. Our neighbors have asked me to speak to you in support of the resolution to complete the Inca Heritage Trail, as well as funding the lights, turf, and parking connectivity between the soccer and softball fields. I'm out in the public through various volunteer opportunities. I spent a lot of days and afternoons at Inca High School announcing local sports probably 30 to 50 days a year. I speak with a lot of parents. A lot of parents are very excited about what's going on across the street from our neighborhood. Um, when the topic comes up, it is very well received and they're very excited about the continued funding of this project. And our goal for our community and what we're looking forward to most is making it more walkable. So our focus is around the Inca Trail and the lighting to keep the people coming back in the evenings. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other members of the public? Jerry. Uh, Jerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I've been gone a while. I guess you wanted to yeah, send me back. You. And it looked pretty pitiful on TV, by the way. At home, it ended up wasn't excited. That's all you got, though. Uh, anyway, I know that the public is just going to fall out of their seat clapping for me today, but when greed takes the place of safety, there's something wrong. The Inca plant, the whole 200 and some acres, should never have a building put on it, period. The contamination on that place is pathetic. The ball fields and all this stuff you to talk about and you to put money into, you to looking at safety? No, you ain't. You're taking the word of a lot of people that hasn't done their homework. It's easy to get people enthusiastic over sports, but when it comes to what I know about the Inca plant and it being the most contaminated place in Buncombe County as a whole, it's pathetic that we've got commissioners that is praising all these projects out there and in the future. This is pathetic. I have never seen, if we had our old time people, you know, out here uh, on the environmental end, this would have never happened. But we don't have them people no more. They're dead. They've even got deed restrictions on these properties out there. You can't even put an animal <laughs> shelter thing on the property at Inca. What do you think about that? If you can't have that, <coughs> what are you doing to put in human life on it? My God, these people need to be educated out here in this audience, and I ain't got time. <coughs> what I'd like to know is the ball field has got a <laughs> board of directors, and we have a person that's sitting on this board by the name of Joe Belcher, that that Joe Belcher, and I don't know where it's him or not, is on the board of directors, and I've asked Joe personally, and he won't admit yes or no to it. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, I'm Hold sorry, on. you wouldn't admit. Sorry. And I want to know if he is or not, because it'd be a conflict and an ethical but situation. Okay. And if it's not him, I want to know who that Joe Belcher is, because I can't find pictures <coughs> of him. So, that's, that's another question. But my concern is, is health and safety. You're connecting all these things, you're connecting the streams, you're connecting all these walkways, and let me tell you what, I've lived here 60 years in the Inca community, and I've got plenty of relatives and everybody that's 
went through that plant. And let me tell you, the horror stories that I can tell you, and don't you think they're gone? They're not. This property is pathetic, and you need to wake up and quit praising this for a bed night for a hotel. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Um, anybody else? Uh, Mr. Yelton. I surprised myself I wasn't going to say anything. But I did want to add this to what Jerry said. You asked the previous board, go call Tom Sobel, David Gant, Patsy Kiefer, David Young, and ask them how many times I told them they were going to have problems at CTS. Does that ring a bell? Doesn't CTS ring a bell? You can nod your head or do something or wink to let me know you're hearing me. Sure. What I know for a fact, when I was taking my hazardous waste course when I was an employee of Buncombe County, I had the young man who was a chemist for American Inca teaching that course. And juries follow this a whole lot closer than I have. We were talking about the Inca plant and the landfill. And I said, I've heard some stuff about that landfill. What all's in there? He said, son, we don't know. Nobody knows. But there's everything in the world in it. Because the Inca plant made rayon tires during World War II. Just like CTS, it was legal to dump that PCE on the ground out there at that time. And in World War II, was going on? You had something toxic? harmful and you need to get rid of it what'd you do with it it's time of war folks you didn't have time to contemplate you got rid of it that question has never been answered and I said that just because I wanted you all to know Jerry's not foolish he's not talking out his you know what he's he's actually sharing some information with you that is true you may not believe me, that's fine. But I was right about CTS, and I was also right about some corruption in Buncombe County for 20 years, wasn't I? Thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, bring back the board. And uh, Josh, you want to comment on? I just wanted to clarify the timeline a little bit. We, um, As soon as we move through these agreements and we have them fully executed between ourselves and EYSO and all the players, uh, we're actually going to design on the Greenway now, um, but we have learned that through our experience with Woodfin, that's a more time-consuming process than we originally anticipate, largely because of the issues that have been raised here with potential environmental contamination and regulatory agencies. So we do budget a considerable amount of time there. Um, we'll be moving through that, and uh, that's one of the reasons that the timeline for constructing the Greenway does take so long. The other reason is that we're uh, passing funds down from the federal government to North Carolina state government to us, and it's a lengthy process to get those funds rolling. Um, we have to use all of their pr procurement processes and procedures in addition to our own, and we've learned the hard way with Woodfin that it, it's not as fast as we would like to move it. So. Um, that's the timeline that we've given as our own most honest guess for the timeline. Uh, there's really no chance of running out of funding um, in terms of between the Greenway and the sports components. They're two different funding pots and we're not allowed to remove funding from the Greenway portion and place it um, on the sports components because it is federal highway funding and it has to go to transportation. So I want to make that clarification. Great. Thank you. Yeah, the 4.8 million has to I mean, people don't have to worry about the grip uh, about the Greenway as far as uh, Chairman, could I have a could I could I comment on the on the board position? Uh, if I am on that board, uh, I've missed a whole lot of meetings because uh, I, I have not attended those. Uh, period. I have not do not have any. It's ridiculous. I am not on that board. So next subject. And it's later. I wouldn't show a little frustration. I apologize for that. But I, I'm not All right. on the board. Thank you. Sir. Any other questions or comments from uh, the board? Um, okay, I'll just make one comment. The um, 
You know, there is a there is a history of environmental contamination in this area. That's that's no secret. But I, I don't agree with the comments that nobody has looked at this or put a lot of serious thought into. Um, there's a, there's a lot of limits on what can happen on the property. There's there's a lot of things that just will never be allowed there because of the um, the contamination history there. But that but that doesn't mean that nothing can ever be done there. There's a lot of good uses for brownfields and um, you know and I think this you know there's been a lot of thought put into assuring that public health and safety is taken into consideration for the, the plans for this site. So there's nothing else. All in favor of the we do have a motion in a second, don't we? I believe we do. Who well, made I'll, I'll move I'll move approval okay. enthusiastically move approval. All right, we have a motion. Second. I'm late for a board meeting. And a second. 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 All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. All right, we've got a couple of budget amendments and Jennifer Chilton. Mr. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> we have one, one additional item for your consideration related to this project. Okay. Um, so communications, if I could have the slides back, please. Thank you. All right, so in addition to moving forward with the agreements that we just discussed, uh, there is an additional consideration for parking lot lighting at Bob Lewis Ballpark, and I'll walk you through that now. Uh, so we are requesting the Board of County Commissioners to authorize our county manager to examine funding methods and negotiate a lease up to $16,000 annually uh, for lease lighting at the parking lots at Bob Lewis Ballfield. I'll walk you through that now. Uh, Bob Lewis parking lot lighting. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we are adding lights that will allow evening tournaments. Um, however, the parking lots are not lit, so there is a question of the safety related to that. So today we are bringing that before you uh, to help mitigate these safety concerns for visitors who are attending evening games. Um, as you're aware, lighting is a key component of the overall project and our ability to recruit tournaments. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a safe environment. Uh, these, ca these costs were not captured in the original TDA grant application, but nonetheless we believe it's valuable and something that you should explore. An initial question as we looked into uh, purchase of lights for the parking lot was whether or not there was a more cost-efficient way to finance this. Uh, so that began us down the path of looking into lease options. I won't bore you with the details, but uh, leasing makes a lot of sense when you're looking to lower uh, out-of-pocket costs um, as well as looking at shorter-term projects. Um, we've conducted some preliminary analysis to estimate leasing costs, and I will present that to you on the next slide. I want to caution you that these estimates are illustrative. Uh, we've based these estimates based on uh, other work at Buncombe County facilities, including the sports park, as well as Owen Park and Lake Julian, to get an idea of cost. We've also requested costs, um, initial costs, a pr pricing sheet from Duke, to get an idea of how these costs would shake up. The table lays out the cost for you from 2019 through 2025. Uh, we've given you three scenarios here. One scenario, the highest, assumes $30 lease per light. Uh, there's a $25 option and a $20 option. Uh, you'll see that the purchase cost would be $300,000 as estimated by Musco. In the year 2019, these are partial costs since we're already uh, partially through the year. Your first uh, year of full cost would be in 2020. Um, as you can see over a cumulative period of time, um, as you can see the, the costs range on an annual basis from $12,000 annually up to $18,000 annually. Cumulatively, uh, through 2025, you're looking at a range between $80,000 and $120,000. Uh, based on our analysis of the situation, if you were to move forward, we would recommend that you look at leasing versus uh, purchase, <coughs> uh, given the out-of-pocket expense, as well as the potential break-even time. Uh, the break-even time for each of these options ranges between 16 and 25 years. That's the initial analysis. If there's any questions, I'm glad to field those. Otherwise, I'll move to our recommendation. We currently Correct. lease our other lights at the other ball fields. No. Pardon? We currently <laughs> lease our lights at our other fields. That, that is correct. County. We have a number of lease lights at the Buncombe County Sports Park and others that I'm sure Josh could allude to. Okay. Thanks. So our recommendation is based on the initial research that we've conducted uh, that this board vote formally to approve that or authorize our county manager to negotiate a lease agreement with the appropriate vendor uh, up to $16,000 annually. Um, if staff are unable to negotiate a lease for that price, we would bring this back to you to the board. 
Our goal, though, is for if you are so willing to approve this so that we do not have to bring it back before the board by setting a maximum threshold. Are there any questions? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any members of the public who wish to comment on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you and good evening. Good evening. All right. Now we come to the budget amendment. Can Jennifer check and roll? Well, Jennifer's got us. I had those somewhere. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. I'm starting. So this evening we have four budget amendment requests for your review. And I'm gonna, Chairman Newman, would you like to review all of these in thorough or would you like to review them one by one? So if that's okay with you, that's, that's, I think that'd be fine. That'd be fine. And we will take public comment on this, but we'll uh, take public comment on all four of them. So w when we get to that. But right. yeah, if you could give us an overview, that'd be great. All right, great. Thank you. So attached with the agenda this evening in the budget amendment summary, I'll begin with number one, which is a budget amendment request for our grant projects fund. Buncombe County receives federal grant funding for administration and direct benefit dollars for the RIDE program, which is the Ridership Independence for Disabled and Elderly program. The county provides 50, a 50% 50 match for the expenses incurred after participant voucher revenues are accounted for. The participant's cost is $2.50 per $10 voucher that they're able to receive through this program. Those revenues are estimated to be $36,170. The federal share amount is estimated to be $65,850, and therefore the county match also $65,850. This amendment enables us to budget the revenues and the expenses in the grant fund, um, as the funding is for multi-year use based on the federal um, fiscal year. The amendment additionally enables us to transfer the county match portion already accounted for in the transportation fund into the grant fund. So we re request approval for that. Okay. And let's go ahead and just touch on each, each of them. So if you want to go ahead and do the second one and the sure. third and fourth. Yes. So in the budget amendment summary, items number two and the three are related. Budget amendment uh, request number two is our special programs fund. Uh, Previously approved have been um, con conservation easements um, on behalf of the Soil Conservation Department. We are ready to close several of those previously approved conservation easements. And those that are outlined here do have project savings as a result. Those savings amount to $16,666. The request from soil conservation is to use those savings for the um, conducting of a farmland protection plan. As I understand it, the last time that the county engaged with someone to conduct a farmland protection plan was approximately 10 years ago. So soil conservation is asking to transfer these funds to their general fund operating budget to engage with a consultant um, to do to conduct a farmland protection plan. Um, and it is outlined that it's a tool used by county and municipal governments in developing recommendations for policies and projects aimed at maintaining the economic viability of the state's agricultural industry and its supporting land base. Number four. This is an Article 46 Capital Projects Fund request. So this is related to the art Article 46 monies for AB Tech. June 19, 2018, the budget for AB Tech existing debt service payments was amended effective for July 1st, 2018. However, there have been no budgetary adjustments 
to professional services and capital fund maintenance budgets since April of 2018. The fiscal year 2019 plan, which you have recently reviewed with AB Tech, um, includes $225,000 of anticipated professional services and a total of $3,850,000 for capital plan maintenance and Elm water repair. After meeting with Interim um, General Services Director Pamela Freeman King, as well as Greg Israel, we arrived at these budgetary um, adjustment requests. We are requesting $198,162 be budgeted in professional services and that $2,356,838 for capital plan maintenance and the Vinoy construction document in, um, in alignment with, the, with that dollar request is attached in the agenda. What I will note is that these dollars are in keeping with the current plan that you just recently reviewed for fiscal year 2019 expenditures. The offsetting source of funding for these expenses is $150,000 of savings, which was previously budgeted for the Elm water remediation um, and has been, that actually has been taken care of in the contract that was for the capital plan maintenance phase one um, for $3.7 million that this board reviewed and approved on October 2nd, 2018. So the total request of $2,405,000, again, is in keeping with the identified plan already outlined. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to comment on any of these budget amendments? All right. Let's take them uh, in order. Is there a motion to approve the first item, which is related to the grant projects fund? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Is there, so there's the items two and three are both related to the conservation easements um, and using the savings to um, create the farmland protection uh, plan. Can we approve them as a single motion, those two items, or do we need to do two and then three? I think we get, we have the choice of approving each of them individually. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the, sec the second and third uh, budget amendment items, which are both related to? the Conservation Easements Program and the Farmland Protection uh, Plan. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And is there a motion to approve uh, budget item number four, which is related to Article 46 Capital Funding AB Tech? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Jennifer, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we come to board appointments. So I'm going to make a uh, recommendation for Barbara Weatherall, Ruth O'Donnell, Lindley Garner for the library board. I'll second that motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, wow. We got two out of three. Two being reappointed. Hmm. Um, should we uh, interview folks for the Mountain Community Capital Fund Operating Committee? Um, there's two vacancies. There's, there is a recommendation for um, um, from the committee, I believe. For if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, there is also an additional um, item behind that that was um, submitted by the. Um, Mr. Tim Love, I don't know if y'all have had a chance to look at that, but it's an item with the recommendation and some information. On a board, on a board, board appointment? Yes. It's a memo. Where is it? Where is it? It's a, it should be a memo right after um, okay. the actual listing of the boards. Hang on. Board of oh, here, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm fine going ahead and, and voting on this tonight. I am if, too. If, is that, is everybody? Okay. Yeah. I'll make a motion that we appoint Jeffrey Kaplan and Robin Payne. Second. Yeah. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thanks. And I think that's all we needed to, that's I think that's all we had to do it on the boards and commissions tonight. Um, so let's go to public comment. Didn't we have Did we one? Sport, the sports. Uh, oh, commission? sports commission. Yeah. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you for catching that. So we had some discussion about this like the last meeting. Um, and so, yeah, we could follow up on that and see if we can put that can one. I make a motion? Yes. I'd like to nominate uh, Commissioner Amanda Edwards. Okay. To fill a seat on sports commission for the commission. All right. I'll second it. I know Commissioner Belcher was also interested in it. You know, so yeah, that, I don't want it's, um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's it's a good thing to have more than one person who's interested in it. Y'all would, of course, either would you would do a great job. Um, so I don't want to split the board on it. You dying to be on it? I kind of am. You kind of am. <laughs> I would really like to serve on that board. She's new. Put her to work. She's new. Put her to work. Yeah, I'll, I'll put her to work. So, so I, all right. So I'll vote for you this time. You vote for me next time. How's that? All right. I'll let it go. Yeah. All right. Unless somebody else wants it. <laughs> okay. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Belcher, and yeah. thank you, Commissioner Edwards, for working that out. Okay. Um, now we come to public comment. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to? Uh, speak to the board about any items that we haven't previously had public comment on at our meeting this evening. Mr. Yelton. And then we'll come over here next. It's fun watching you guys. It's like a bouncing ball. And uh, I heard some things tonight that I just got to comment on. If a for-profit takes money from the county, think about what I'm saying. If a 5013C doesn't pay taxes, where does the money come from? Just maybe I know from experience that government service improves when they have to compete with a for-profit corporation. This has been found in the trash industry, folks. What did you do with your garbage? Pick up. You farmed it out. What did the city of Asheville do to process their recyclables? Who processes recyclables? Can the two companies in Buncom County that have recyclables both process them? No, only one. Just maybe, if more franchises were offered, surface, the services might just improve. I think I just heard at the last of the night, you're going to lease lights for the ball field? That's a franchise, folks. Why don't you do your own lights if you're supposed to do everything? It's cheaper to lease it from a for-private company. Uh, how about clean buildings? Do you do a franchise on that? Very obviously, AB Tech didn't do too good a contract on cleaning their buildings, did they? Or maintaining their maintenance. And folks, if I remember correctly, this county has given AB Tech money every year it's been in existence because we are a host county. And we have had the head of the AB Tech on this board, and this board has given them money every year. Why did they get into that shape, Mike, and why did you have to go over there and cause all that stink to find out what's going on? Thank God you did. If the government does all, eliminates competition, where's the government going to get any money, folks? No profits, no taxes. Please, I beg you establish a budget and make them stick to it. It's going to be hard, as you saw tonight. 
because they're going to have the voting pressure on them. And you have to tell them yay or nay and why it should be yay or nay or sell them. And they can fire you. But it takes guts, folks, to stick to your budget. I'm looking for y'all sticking to that budget. And now a praise. i got six seconds. If the mother goes off, you can give me an extra five seconds because I'm praising you. Thank God that young man over there referred me to another member of the staff here. Mr. Yelp, and I got to go look your time's at up. all of the checks on the Internet. Your time's and, yeah, up. Yeah, I know it's up, and I'm going to take that time, or you can arrest me and throw me out, Brownie. Please I don't really down. care. Is, you know I know. time's up. Thanks. All right. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Commissioners, and an enthusiastic welcome to you, our new county manager. My name is Anita Metcalf. I know many of you on this board. I live at 221 Liberty Road in Candler, and I live on a family farm that the property has been in my family for over 100 years. Uh, I came this evening to speak to you from a rather unique perspective. Uh, I'm a native of Candler, that's unique, and I work with Buncombe County government for 26 and a half years. I am wearing tonight my 25 year service watch and I'm proud, very proud to have been a member of the county employees. I worked with employment and training programs and Commissioner Whiteside, you would remember the Neighborhood Youth Corps back many years ago that eventually became employment and training programs and then I became director of training and development for Buncombe County. Um, I was responsible for developing programs, training programs for county employees such as new employee orientation, supervisory training, continuous process improvement and I will have to tell you that Mr. Holland was one of the most outstanding and enthusiastic participants in those programs. Um, we developed an, um, uh, an employee um, evaluation plan and we trained, I trained people in the county supervisors on how to conduct evaluations. Uh, and I also worked with AB Tech in um, providing computer training for county employees and a number of other consulting firms to help the county achieve the skill level that they need in order to best serve the citizens of this county. Uh, after 26 and a half years, I began working at AB Tech as Vice President of College Relations and then eventually Vice President of um, College Advancement and Executive Director of the Foundation. When I began, we had six scholarships. And today, I think we have over 450. Uh, I currently serve on the AB Tech Foundation Board, and our donors watch with interest the negotiations that go on um, almost daily, and they wonder what is going on. Uh, it's because of the most generous people that we have been able to um, develop those scholarships to over 450. And I thank them for their generosity and um, for their generosity to college students. I come to you today. Um, your, time, your time is up unless there are other people who give up their time so that you have additional time. It takes, it takes eight uh, people to do that. If there are eight people who would raise their hands, then you can get additional time or it is limited to three minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening, and, and thank you for your service as elected officials. My name is Richard Hurley. And I was an AB Tech trustee for like 20 years, served as chair, a couple of different stints, and I'm currently on the foundation board. And I'd like to just take a moment to, to fill in some blanks from history, if I could, because like many AB Tech trustees, I actively supported the 2011 quarter cent tax increase, the referendum, 
And some months after that, after its approval, State Representative Nathan Ramsey successfully submitted a local bill transferring the building uh, authority from AB Tech to the county. Um, I called my old friend Nathan up and said, just out of curiosity, what was the impetus behind this? And he said, well, he said, Wanda Green had told me that she was in favor of it and that then President Hank Dunn was in favor of it and that I, meaning the trustees, we were all in favor of it. Well, I told him, as did Hank Dunn in a conversation, that neither of us nor the board were in favor of this local bill. Now, when the improper use of county funds by the recent county administration came to light, I started connecting the dots on why this control of AB Tech constru construction projects was so important. I think I now know why. But in the summer of 18, Commissioner Tr and Trustee uh, Mike Fryer uh, asked a state legislator to submit a local bill in Raleigh to extend the county's authority for AB Tech construction for five more years. AB Tech President Dennis King and the Board of Trustees learned after the fact about this, and I was just curious if the commissioners supported his, his action prior to this, or was this strictly um, something that, that Commissioner Fryer uh, decided to do, and I'm not being accusatory, I just asked that question. Um, I attended the February 7th AB Tech Board of Trustees meeting after having learned that the county commissioners were going to present a proposal that afternoon to make the college whole on the funds which were misappropriated from the tax money earmarked for AB Tech construction projects. I was truly taken aback when I came to that meeting and found that the proposal actually came from Commissioner Fryer and Interim County Manager George Wood and not the commissioners. So I, I was a bit troubled that the intent was to get the board to approve it, then return to get approval from the commissioners. It seemed like a cart and horse situation. So I was puzzled why the proposal didn't come directly from the commissioners, and that would be a question. It just appeared like a rush job, and, and I couldn't really understand it because, and it seemed illogical to me that we wouldn't have waited a couple of more weeks for the new county manager to come on board since she would be owning the repercussions uh, of the commission's actions. And regarding the five point of, I guess that got me. Your time is just, up. I want to thank you for, uh, your, for listening to this because it is an important issue, and uh, thank you Thanks, in advance for working for win-win for both organizations. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. It takes eight. It takes eight members to yield for a person to get more than three minutes. But you can speak. But you can't just yield your individual time under our rules. Sorry. I'm Roger Metcalf, and I'm the husband of the beautiful lady who was just up. <laughs> and I share that farm in Camden with her nice place to live and welcome to the new county manager I'm going to finish this as she has it I come to you this evening not as an adversary but in a conciliatory manner listening to discuss uh, this evening in con the contracts and more are very complicated and I ask this board to consider tabling the memorandum of understanding that you talked about earlier because it would be in the best interest of the county and also in the best interest of AB Tech. Representatives from each group could get together and sit around the table and with the new county manager who has nothing to do with it to start with, but needs to have something to do with it and listen to the interests of each other and develop a, a plan that will best serve the interests of the citizens and of this county. To this point, it appears that more has been developed by the county without initial input from AB Tech. A former resident of AB, president of AB Tech often said a rising tide lifts all ships. Together we can create this rising tide. The citizens of this community deserve no less. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening about this very important issue that's facing our community. It would be a good way to, for the county to get back some trust and it'd be a good way Commissioner Edwards to make AB Tech whole. Thank you, Mr. and Ms. Metcalf. Um, Mr. Rice, and does anybody else want to speak? All right, we'll do Mr. Rice and then we'll come to you next. Okay.
Well, I'm glad to see my neighbors here. They're wonderful. He is my ninth grade teacher. You know how old he is now, don't you? But anyway, they're, they're fine folks. Uh, transparency, trust. My goodness, we didn't hear all these big words anymore. All because of one person or two or three in the county. Mrs. Green and her predecessors. My, my concern is one big one, and that is with our new county manager. She don't know me, and she probably don't want to know me. But I think she's going to do a good job because the other one done a good job. But you know what? She didn't have the oversight. Did you hear that, Miss New County Manager? The oversight of this board was the problem. It wasn't the county manager. You let her go. You know, you let a kid go, and they're going to get in trouble, ain't they? Might even get convicted and brought up here. So the oversight is the problem. So I'd like to propose, and I ain't been around here in a while, so I'd like to propose something with the new county manager's position, and that is that every record or every note, every piece of paper that goes through that office is collected and stored for a period of time, and it is sought through with auditors or anybody else that needs to look at those records so they don't land, land up in the landfill where Mrs. Green's record did by the truckloads. Now you're looking at a man that knows. He's not just talking out of his hat. This has happened for many years. I've been here a lot longer than any Yuns. And I say Yuns, I'm from the south there, Mrs. Manager. Uh, but I'll educate you, but I can't educate fools. So I would ask that you all put something in place that's going to protect these records, and it'll also protect the county manager herself. And I don't think she'd be against that if she's an honest person, and I believe she is, according to the record. If you don't care about the record being took care of and stored, then you must not be too honest. So... Let's see what the oversight board here will do. Yuns are oversight. You know that? We sit back here and yuns look over us. That's about the only oversight I saw in these other boards when we had it before. So let's take a hold of the ham and do something right and correct the record. Thank you very much. Good luck, can manager. All right, thank you, Mr. Rice. Yes, ma'am. Okay, sure. Anybody else? All right. Uh, last chance. Okay. All right. Um, we have just a couple of announcements before, um, before we adjourn. On March 19th at 5 p.m., the county commissioners will hold the regular meeting here at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. April 2nd at 5 p.m., the county commissioners will hold the regular meeting at 200 College Street, room 326. And also on April 16th at 5 p.m., the county commissioners will hold a regular meeting at 200 College Street, room 326. April 19th, county offices will be closed for Good Friday. And that concludes our business for the evening. We're adjourned. Thank you all for being here.